Reddit. What's your best no time to explain? Let's go. Story? Me and my friend are heading to Sonic for lunch point suddenly he screams. Pull over. Pointing across the road and across two lanes of traffic. Why? No. Time to explain. Geo. So. I hit the gas and barely avoid getting creamed. Across the way I see what he noticed first. A man holding down a woman in the dirt near the ditch beside the road and striking her. We start to get out. He sees us, lets her go, and gets in his car. A moment later another car pulls up, and some older women swarm over the struck woman as he begins to drive away. Point we hop in our car and give chase. I hand him my phone. He calls the cops. We end up leading the way on a car chase with officers slowly assembling en masse behind us. Finally we chase him to a house and block the driveway with our car as he gets out and runs behind the house point knowing we have no right to chase we let the police take it from there, but we check the car. It had kids in it. The police interviewed us later, told us that the kids belonged to the woman and if we hadn't followed the man, they might not have found the car felt like big damn heroes best part was on the way home we helped a fella with a broken radiator and in the middle of getting him taken care of, the police called us after they caught him and I got to say this awesome line, bro, that was officer, they need us down at the station, broken, radiator guy was all, who are you, edit. Due to the overwhelming popularity of my post, I present to you my partner in crime on this. Steven Point yes, he has a Spider-Man costume. When I was 8, my parents took me over to their friend's house for an early dinner party. They had a daughter my age who was also my friend. She was really into animals and nature, so she wanted me to go with her about a block down her street to investigate a bird's nest she saw earlier in a tree. We go, she starts climbing, while I'm on the ground watching. Then, about half a block away, this appy looking surfer dude with long blonde hair, and wearing nothing but shorts, walks out of this house and notices us. I notice him for about 2 seconds, and then luck back up in the tree at my friend. Next, I hear a loud whistle, and when I look back in the direction of the surfer dude, he has his shorts down around his ankles with his willy whacker out in all its glory. I yell run. My friend is clueless, but somehow she manages to jump out of the tree, and we run back to her house as fast as our pint-sized legs will carry us. Luckily, my dad and her dad were right inside, and when I yelled there's a naked man chasing us. They were outside almost immediately. They find the surfer dude standing right in front of their driveway. I remember my dad saying hey man, are you pulling your pants down in front of children? And the guy responding with something like fuck you, man and then walking away point the amazing thing is that we called the cops and they came over to file a report, but they recommended not pressing charges because the guy knew where we lived and might seek revenge. This was back in the mid 1970s. So I had a job driving a taxi, night shift. I'm waiting in the cabin loop for my next fare when a native Indian stumbles up to my taxi, asks me if I want to buy some beer. No thanks, pal. You sure? I'll sell you a case for $15. Keep in mind I'm in Canada, and a case will normally cost around $40. I say sure, and he hops in, and tells me to drive around the corner to the golf course. I'm skeptical, but I go for it. We arrive, and he runs into some bushes, and comes out with a 24 pack of beer. I laugh, pay him, and ask if there's more. Yeah, if you buy 10 I'll sell them to you for 10 dollar bucks each. I gave him 190 dollars more. He runs towards the bushes, looks back at me, and yells well you're gonna come help me with them, or what? I follow him to the bushes, there is a skid full of cases of beer. We take 19 more, and load them into the back of my taxi van. I get the nice gentleman's phone number for next time, and we say our goodbyes. Fast forward 15 minutes. I've driven home. It's 3am. I was living in a house in a row of town homes. Neighbors surely hear me pull up, open and slam my door. I run in, wake up my roommate, and yell no time to explain, let's go. He rushes downstairs, puts on shoes, and follows me back to the cab. I open the rear doors and his jaw drops. Where did you find this? No time to explain. I respond. So here we are, my half-naked friend and I running 20 cases of beer from the street to my house at 3am. 
I'm amazed that no neighbors had awoken and looked out their windows and called the phone number on the van point when we finish and I had time to explain. My roommate gave me $200 and we went and got another 20 cases, this time from a skid hidden behind some trees at a park on a local lake point TLDR. Bought 20 cases of beer from an Indian. Woke up rumored at 3 a.m. to help rush it into our house. We built a wall between our kitchen and living room with cases of said beer. Camping at a friend's house with my wife. He had a glorious stretch of land and we had a tent, a nice little campfire, and had just finished dinner with leftovers sitting on the grill. We hear coyote howls about a mile off and think with the smell of food in the air, maybe we should pack up and head back to his house for the night. He'd brought his antique military jeep that had no suspension to carry the gear and in case we needed emergency transportation back to the house. In the middle of packing he screams get in the car, now, I hop in the passenger seat the same time he gets in the driver's side. The jeep starts moving as I swing out and pick up my wife with one arm and slap her down on my lap. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention she's blind point driving down an extremely bumpy dirt road with no suspension at 30 miles an hour. All that I could think of was a scene in Jurassic Park where the dude in the back is saying must go faster. The coyotes were chasing us, we rolled up to the house. I guess they didn't like the lights or the smell of civilization and left point the next morning. They had gone through the entire camp and paw prints were everywhere. Turns out my friend had seen a pack of shiny eyes charging us the previous night point we were lucky. I was on a sales trip with two other dudes and we went out drinking. Anyway, one guy had had enough around 11 o'clock and went back to his room. Me and the other moron continue drinking, which culminates in us getting kicked out of a wine bar at 2am, so we head back to our hotel. On the way down our hallway, my coworker decides to knock on our other guy's door and fack with him about leaving so early. When our other coworker opened his door he was super pissed, but really drunk coworker shoots past him and into the room, at which point they start arguing so I leave and go to my room. At 5am my phone starts blowing up, but I ignore it, and then the phone in my room starts ringing so I grab it. Really drunk coworker from the night before is in a panic and tells me to pack my sheet and meet him in the lobby despite the fact that we were supposed to stay another three nights. I ask why and he says no time to explain just meet me in the lobby now. I pack and head down. Once in the lobby, he tells me that he apparently passed out in our other guy's bed and that dude got pissed and called some hookers and left the door cracked for them and then switched hotels. So really drunk guy wakes up to two black hookers who want to party. He has no clue what's going on and tries to explain that he didn't call them. Well, now the ladies just want to be paid for showing up. Really drunk guy refuses, so the ladies leave to go get their pimp so he can settle the matter. Drunk guy freaks out, goes to his room and minutes later he can hear the pimp banging on the door to the room he had been in. Freaking out even further he packs and then calls me when he thinks the coast is clear. After the valet brings the car around and we get in, we see the two hookers pointing us out to their boss as they had just been waiting outside to kneecap someone. We drive off in a hurry and check into another hotel. The end point TLDR Kawaka pissed off a pimp and we had to leave a hotel pronto. I know this will probably get buried, but I haven't ever had the opportunity to tell this story in years. When I was about 11 or 12, my dad took my stepbrother and me to my uncle's comic book shop to buy some new X-Men cards that he had just gotten in. My uncle usually stays open until sundown or 7 o'clock, but this night he stayed open until 8 o'clock because of the new release point. When we get to the store, I hop out of the van first and run to the front door at the exact same time this young black kid in a hoodie is coming out. We do that little shuffle dance where you don't know which way the other person is going. He took off to the left. I went right. I looked for my uncle, calling his name. Hey Mike. Mike. I didn't see him. The kid I ran into turned around and said, oh, Mike's in the back. So, my brother and I ran to the back storage room to look for him, excited to buy our new cards and my dad meandered around the front point a few seconds later, I hear my father yelling get out here. Now, get in the faking car, while motioning for us to hurry up. Now my dad never cursed. 
He even slapped my leg once when I said sheet one time in his presence. When finally get into the car, wondering what had happened, all he could say was Mike's hurt. He's been shot, as it happened. This 18 year old kid that I shuffled with had brought a gun with him into the store, not necessarily with the intent to rob and murder him, as his manslaughter charge dictates, but saw the opportunity when he was closing up. He robbed him, told him to turn around and unplug the phone from the wall and put around in the back of his head point. After he left the store, he took off down the street, barefoot for some reason, and threw his gun into a nearby creek. By the time the police caught him, he had dropped almost all the cash he had taken and carried only a $20 bill. All in all, he murdered my uncle for less than $200 point I was brought into the nearby police station, put in this colorful room with toys and teddy bears, and gave a physical description of the guy. With my and my father's statements, the kid got 10 years for manslaughter. Admittedly, my father still hasn't recovered. I'll keep this army story brief point my platoon was out on a bridge reckon in support of a larger route reckon operation. We had been sent to a simple beam bridge on a road that came down from the mountains and intersected with the main route point we parked our small convoy out of sight about 400 meters away from the bridge. Our LT, between being on the radio with hire, quickly tasked the platoon sergeant with establishing 360 degree protection via a perimeter and to take charge of the bridge wreck and report. My squad was ordered to aid in the report. Our other three squads were sent out about 400 meters, spread in all directions to establish the perimeter, with a focus on the far side of the bridge's security point fire team Bravo began measurements on the deck, while my fire team began evaluating the width of the abutments. About 5 minutes in, the LT came sprinting towards us yelling, stop, stop what you're doing, follow me, faking hurry. We did just that, following him back to our concealed convoy of vehicles. He led us straight to one of the 2.5T trucks, our RTO was in the back already. When we got to it, he jumped in the back as well, and they started handing boxes of C4 to us. The platoon sergeant was coming up with fireteam bravo as the RTO handed me a large coil of dead cord. LT started to explain that we just got a frago, our mission is now hasty bridge demolition. Detonation on hires command point or fac point a few of our guys were sent to update the squad leaders on the perimeter with the situation and to make sure everyone was well concealed from the road and had cover from the bridge. My team ran back to the bridge with our demo supplies, generally a no no, but we didn't have any blasting caps, they're pretty unstable, demo knots for the win point we eyeballed the demo calculations for the abutments, multiplied by about 5 then tamped our C4 as best as we could on the quick. Sapper knotted onto a double ring main then lead both with shock tube into our MDI then M81 initiators the platoon sergeant went to go check on the perimeter and took his battle buddy. I just laid concealed next to the detonators behind some rocks for cover with my battle buddy. We were shortly joined by the LT and RTO point we had been hunkered down for what felt like hours. I had started rummaging through my cargo pockets for some MRE goodies when the LT got hailed by hire. Prepare to detonate within the next 5 minutes, my stomach knotted, a mounted enemy patrol will be crossing your AO, make sure you time your detonation accordingly, my jaw dropped. This is some faking John Wayne sheet, I exclaimed excitedly trying to mask my nerves within a few minutes, we started hearing the low hum of vehicles approaching from the direction of the mountains. The sound steadily grew louder as they came into view. It was a small convoy, ragtag cars and a pickup filled with men in the back, all traveling tight. This was our enemy patrol. When the first vehicle began to cross the bridge, my battle buddy and I picked up an initiator each point we toasted, to us, to us, we did all but clink the detonators together ceremoniously. LT rolled his eyes. About 5 seconds later, he shouted now. There was a slight delay. It seemed longer than it should be, boom, a thick cloud of smoke, and flying chunks of metal and concrete came raining down point we assaulted through the objective with our close side perimeter security. Everything went to plan. After conducting our SOP actions on the objective, we mounted up and headed back to our company's location to further assist with the route reckon. 
I don't think I've ever seen Arco prouder than when we met up with him. Point he had a sheet eating mic, it just banged the prom queen grin on his face. Point TLDR. Order changed mid mission. Hastily blow up a bridge with bad guys on it. I was tripping on shrooms with my buddy and his gangster friend. I'm drooling and giggling and kind of lolling around while they are having some intense conversation. They reach a sort of crescendo where my buddy is like look in my eyes, man, it's me, it's okay and gangster friend is just kind of losing his sheet rocking back and forth with his hands over his mouth and then says I gotta wash my face and gets up and goes to the bathroom. Immediately my buddy jumps up, opens the window and leaps out while urgently saying go, go, go. I was clueless but had made it through a few crazy situations with this particular buddy so I just followed his lead. It is pissing rain out, neither of us has shoes or a shirt on, and we are sprinting down the road like crazy people. I kept looking back to see what we were running from and didn't see anybody, so I finally got him to stop and tell me what was going on. Apparently his gangster buddy had accidentally slipped and told him about some ongoing criminal activity, and he thought that the guy was going to kill us to keep us from telling. I convinced him that we should go back to our apartment. Halfway there he got spooked by a car and jumped a fence, disappearing into some neighborhood to the sound of barking dogs and tipped over trash cans. At this point I just said fuck it, I'm tired and you're just faking paranoid and went home and crashed. Fortunately gangster dude didn't kill me in my sleep. I got woken up the next morning by a cop who told me I needed to pick up my friend from the station because he refused to talk to anyone or leave the police station until he saw me alive. Good times. Okay, I have one for this. My wife and I went to Scandinavia in the winter for our honeymoon. First Copenhagen, then Helsinki, then Northern Finland. Yes, this is an odd choice point our flight got diverted and en route to Copenhagen, our luggage, including all of our winter gear, was lost and the airline was unable to locate it for the 4 days we were in Copenhagen. However, we made friends with one of the customer service agents at the airport. We returned to the airport on the day of our flight to Helsinki, still with no luggage and dreading the arctic cold we were about to fly into. Temperatures were in the single digits in Finland, but unable to do anything about it. Magically, we found our luggage at the airport that morning and went through security to our gate point. It was about half an hour before boarding when our friend from customer service on the other side of the airport ran up to us and said, follow me and don't ask any questions. We don't have much time and there is something I must do for you then. He led us through a series of back hallways in the airport to his office. What? I'm about to tell you. You must tell no one else. He said. In 20 minutes, our pilots are going to announce a strike and all our flights will be grounded. This was in no way public knowledge point he put us on another flight to Helsinki with a different airline and we watched in gratitude and amazement from the Finnair terminal as the strike was announced. And our original flight, along with every single other SAS flight leaving Copenhagen, was grounded point epilogue. We found ourselves in Copenhagen again a year later, and we went to the airport specifically to try and find our friend and thank him, but it was his day off. I'd ask Radid to pass on my thanks, but I'm pretty sure what he did was against company policy and I wouldn't want to get him in trouble for doing a good deed for a young couple. A little over two years ago, I was in an abusive marriage. I had realized that the abuse was never going to stop and told my husband that I was going to divorce him. The next day, he acted as if nothing was wrong and he had accepted that I was moving out as soon as I was able. He was working until midnight, so he wasn't home. Yet when I went to bed point I woke up later to my husband twisting my arms behind my back and slamming his head into my face. He kept me pinned down for what felt like an eternity, out of sheer desperate on, and despite how much it hurt, I somehow was able to get out of the hold eventually, and ran into the bathroom with my phone, slamming the door shut with my body just in time point I called every close friend I had, but no one would pick up the phone. It was now after 3am. I had been pinned down for over 2 hours. I finally overcame my shyness and texted a coworker I had recently met who just happened to live nearby and who had also told me that he stays up most of the night. I texted are you awake and got the response yeah, scared, 
that my husband's efforts to pick the lock on the door would soon prove fruitful, I decided to take the chance and make a run for it. I shoved my cell phone into my tank top and calculated the location of my coat, shoes, and wallet point. When I burst out of the door, my animal instincts took over. He threw me on the ground. I jumped back up. He grabbed my arms. I twisted away. I was able to grab my shoes and nothing else, but that was enough. I ran down the hallway barefoot and then into the snow and 10 degree minipolis winter. I hid by the building for a moment, putting on my shoes, and then ran to my coworker's apartment. Downtown Minneapolis is a scary place, even if you're not dressing in only a tank top and sweet pants at 3am, but I ignored the calls from random people on the street, and kept running point once I was outside my coworker's apartment, I suddenly became truly scared. What if he wasn't even home? I made the phone call, I'm outside, I'll explain later. Please please, can you let me in, my coworker came downstairs a moment later, a bewildered look on his face. His reaction upon seeing me there, barely dressed and shivering in the snow, was simple, Jess, what the hell. Two years later, I'm divorced and the happiest I've ever been. That coworker is the best friend I have ever had, and I'm so grateful to him for letting a girl he had just met into his apartment at 3am without any explanation. Okay here we go, a few years ago, I was a group leader for a language school and Malta teenagers go there during the summer to learn English and party in the Mediterranean, so part of my duty, besides being a tourist guide, was to take a big bunch of 16 to 20 year olds out to the clubs at night point Malta has a big party district called Paceville, which is basically one big square in the middle with small streets full of clubs and bars going in all directions. There are always some policemen and ambulances stationed at that square we went to a big hip hop club near the big square called Havana, a slightly dodgy place, not my idea to take the kids there by the way, we went in there with 4 group leaders, and about 40 kids, 2 of them a Turkish couple around 17 to 18 years older. Turkish girl was really gorgeous looking, and her boyfriend was kind of a skinny guy that didn't look good enough to be a decent match for the girl at first sight, which often tempted men to try to get close with his girlfriend, even when he was around. The first hour in the club is pretty relaxed, no troubles, a good vibe all around point suddenly a big group of Italians from another language school come in there, and in a minute the entire place is way too overcrowded and everyone starts to get more pissed and aggressive. Not the Italian group's fault, they didn't act aggressive or anything, it was just the extra amount of people in there that made people pissed. Ten minutes later, the Turkish guy comes running at me down the stairs from the upper floor, dragging his girl behind him, looks me in the eye with this wild stare and shouts in his thick Turkish accent we leave club now now now. Very important, let's go right now with everyone, no time, come on, come on. A little perplexed, I start gathering my kids who luckily all were next to the bar at the lower dancer floor I was at by some divine intervention I managed to gather them all really quick, and about 5 minutes later my entire group is leaving the club with no trouble we get some 30 meters away to a burger king next to the club, and as I start to confront the guy what that was all about. A whole bunch of policemen from the main plaza start to storm the club with big sticks in their hands people run out screaming with blood all over their faces and clothing. Moments later even more policemen arrive and an utter riot is breaking out right in front of our eyes than the Turkish guy told me what happened. Apparently some guy had just out of nowhere grabbed his girlfriend's tigs, so he punched him in the face. A Swedish guy who saw it and stood next to me told me that he had never seen a punch like that and that the guy just collapsed in the middle of the club with a clearly broken nose seconds after that. People started to look for the guy who knocked him out, but he was already gone and somehow the people looking for him had started a fight with some of the bouncers who in return thought that they had knocked the guy out this ended in a massive brawl with hundreds of people involved, several dozen injured people and loads of arrests. I was eating a double whooper and watched the entire scene like it was a movie. A few days later a Maltese colleague of mine tells me that the club owners might lose their license over this, which in the end they didn't, because Maltese officials like their bribes, tl. DNR went to club as group leader of 40 teenagers one of the kids starts a fight that leads to a riot involving 
the entire club, including police storming the place tells me to get the fuck out of there ASAP with every one entire group managers to get out of there unharmed, while many people that had nothing to do with in the first place got injured or arrested. There I was at a house party, I'd recently sworn off drinking due to getting alcohol poisoning at the last one, so I'm easily the only sober person there. I had wandered onto the front lawn and was chatting up some folks when I saw a guy get out of his car and angrily flag down a bike cop. Once the cop had stopped this random guy started gesturing wildly and using very aggressive body language point my brain began turning the scene over, why would a guy in a suit be giving a cop sheet? I blinked and saw them. The house was at the top of a T intersection, down each of the three streets sat police cars, police and two paddy wagons gearing up for the raid. The man in the suit was an undercover cop who was trying to get the bike cop out of there, before he blew their aid point I ran inside, grabbed every person I knew, and said ditch your drink, and come with me right the fuck now. Luckily I had a bit of a reputation and only one of them questioned me. My response was, if you stay what happens next is on you. His eyes got big, he turned to the girl he was talking to, and told her he had to go point I found our host and said, hey man this was a great party, but the cops are forming up outside and ah, uh, I gotta go. My friends and I booked out the back, and ran down some alleyways, only to run smack dab into a lone cop, who must have been left to watch these same alleys for runners. He looked us up and down, and asked where we were headed in such a hurry. I said why officer it's, whatever time it was, the 7 to 11 up the street, should be getting ready to restock, and we are off to see, if we can get some free donuts. He, laughed, thought about it, and wished us a safe journey point and that is a story, of how I kept about 20 people from getting kicked out of college for underage drinking. Not long after graduating high school, my buddy worked the late shift at a local gas station. Because we were night owls, a bunch of us would end up hanging out there, enjoying free coffee and sodas and just shooting the breeze. Because of this, we got to know some of the local late shift cops who also liked to come in, drink free coffee and shoot the breeze. These cops were not bad dudes, they were just a little bit rowdy and unhinged. One night, we were chilling outside the gas station, and introducing one of our newer friends to the guy that worked at the gas station. A cop car rolls into the parking lot with its windows up, so we can't get a good look at who's inside. We are trying to figure out if it's one of the guys we know when the window rolls down a couple of inches and a gun barrel slides out to point at us, we hear pop 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 and scatter. It was a couple of the cops we knew, and they had just fired on us with a paintball gun. My friend who worked at the gas station looks at me and the new guy and yells let's go. As the cops peel out, the employee pops his car's trunk, pulls out a fully loaded paintball gun, and tosses it to me. The new guy and I dive into his car, and we chase the cops down, firing paintballs out the window, while racing down the highway at top speeds. We ended up in this weird paintball car fight for hours, hunting each other down point the new guy had no idea what to think. Hanging out with some people for the first time and getting drawn into a paintball fight with the police, but handled himself very well. I was sitting in my mom's house one night and my cousin's girlfriend was staying with us because he was in the hospital. She goes outside to the car to sit and talk on the phone, which wasn't unusual. Privacy was hard to come by point I was sitting in my dad's chair, when my aunt starts calling my phone, I pick it up, it's my cousin, all he says is don't ask, just go out to the car, and stop her from whatever she's doing. So I stuff my phone in my pocket, and go outside to see what's going on point my cousin's girlfriend is in the car, with a hypodermic needle full of air in her arm, her cell phone was on her other ear, and she was crying and talking to him point I walk up to the car, the window is halfway down, and her hands are preoccupied, so I ask her what's wrong, she finally noticed me as she heard my voice, and started screaming fuck you, fuck you, into the phone. And she moved to throw the phone down. At the moment I took my chance point I threw my arms through the window and pulled the hypodermic out of her arm. My cousin is a diabetic. It was their shared car. So there were a few in his emergency bag. And she immediately began to roll the window up. The windows were electric. So it didn't take long for my arms 
to get wedged between the window glass and the top of the car door she then reaches between the seats and grabs a hunting knife that my cousin kept in his car for whatever reason he did. She stuck the knife in her wrist and began to pull it up her wrist. She only moved it about an one eighth of an inch before I was able to move my body correctly to get my hands on her wrists and pull her arms apart, but now I couldn't let her go point I screamed for my mom to call an ambulance about a suicide attempt in progress and she began to turn the knife on me and I received a few scrapes across my knuckles I held her for about 15 minutes until the ambulance and police arrived, she was crying and saying that her life was over, she would never get onto a police force now that a suicide attempt was on her record. I knew she had worked hard to pass the physical exam and was beginning to work her way through college. I felt horrible point I finally got back inside, I was shaking from the adrenaline still and noticed my phone was still in my pocket and my cousin was still on the other side of the line and had heard everything. In the 15 minutes his girlfriend of 6 years had broken down about cheating on him while he was in the hospital in coma, a byproduct of fighting cystic fibrosis. She had said it was so hard to live with him and that she had no idea how to handle the idea of him dying. She couldn't take it point my cousin has been my best friend my entire life. I know that feeling of helplessness in the face of that kind of darkness. It was an intense moment of me sharing my ways of coping with knowing someone I love so much would be taken so soon. I mentioned nothing of her unfaithfulness while speaking to her. But my cousin had heard everything while still in the hospital. We've never really spoken of it since point I saw her again three days later. She had dark bruises around her wrists and forearms from where I had gripped her so hard, I had no idea I had grabbed her that hard. I'm a pretty big guy, and she was a fairly petite lady, but still. The cut on her arm was covered in a gauze bandage, and there was a small bruise where the needle had been, but besides that, you couldn't tell anything had happened, except she was quiet whenever she was alone near me. Point I think about it sometimes, and it still bothers me. Seeing someone drive a knife into themselves and start dragging it through their own flesh with every intent of ending their life, that determination is horrific. Point TLDR got a call from my cousin to go outside and check on his girlfriend. I did so, and I interrupted her suicide attempt in progress. I lived in a small town growing up point when we were about 17 or so. Skating was our activity of choice. The best place in our town to do so was a park. A park directly adjacent to the projects in our small town point, but the people there never came to the park. We hung out there the entire time during high school. One evening, I want to say in the middle of the week, we stayed there pretty late point it was me, two male friends, and all three of our girlfriends. Now, at some point, me and Chris, we choose to drive to the store real fast and get some sodas. On the way back from the convenience store, we are pulling into the parking lot of the park, and we see two 11 to 13 year old kids. It's summer, our windows are down point they yell, moo, as we slow to make the turn. Chris and I laugh, and moo back enthusiastically point then the two kids, Hispanic, yell in response, faking white as beaches, and flip us off. Now, this doesn't sit well. We stop the car, get out, and the kids are obviously terrified. I don't remember exactly what we said, but it was stern, but kind. Something along the lines of you guys really shouldn't yell things like that, it's not nice. I specifically remember not cursing and being quite adult about it. The kids didn't respond, just turned and ran after we finished giving them a 4 second lecture. I clearly remember shrugging and casually getting back in the car. It was about 8 or 9 at night. We turn into the parking lot and drive the length of it. When we arrive where our other friend and the girls are parked, they suddenly jump up and start screaming and running from the sidewalk towards their car we hop out quickly, but everyone is yelling, get in the car. Geo 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 geo. I turn towards the turn off to the parking lot that we had passed through no less than about 15 seconds before and saw several things happening at once. The street was about 100 yards or more away. That was the length of the parking lot. Across that was the projects. Close bracket. I saw a group of 25 or 30 adults and teenagers pouring out of the projects, running directly at us. 
Also, I saw a car pulling into the parking lot, maybe a few seconds in front of the approaching mob, and it was hauling as it took me a moment to recognize that the car belonged to Chris's mother. I turned to the three girls and my other friend, and they were already in their car, nearly ready to pull away. I screamed that they should go, that Chris and I would go in his car. Chris was jumping up and down, waving his hands, attempting to get his mother's attention. The girls and our other friends sped by us, and apparently since angry project mobs don't want to get run over, the people coming at us opened a giant hole for our friends to escape through point right about this time, Chris's mother had parked, coming to a screeching halt in a parking spot about 30 feet away. He had been desperately trying to get her attention on the approaching mob, but had failed, we were still right outside the car, and the mob was all but upon us. Out of options, we both jumped in his large boot-like car and locked and closed the doors. Before he could start the car, the mob surrounded our car, yelling obscenities and pounding on the windows. Then breaking the windows. Then beginning to rock the car. We retreated to the back seat. There was a baseball bat and a couple skateboards. Chris took the bat, and I took a skateboard. All the windows were now broken out to some degree, and people were reaching in trying to beat the sheet out of us. We are feebly attempting to strike anyone or any limb that comes into range, but between the window punches and various items being thrown at us, we are not doing too well. But we are not really getting hurt either this goes on for a minute or so when suddenly we hear a scream. Chris recognizes this as his mother and exits the car in a fury, much to my dismay. I didn't follow. My battle continued for maybe another half minute, until suddenly, the entire mob bolted away. I exited the vehicle, to see two cop cars with lights and sirens entering the parking lot, Chris's mother standing there, looking furious, and Chris bracing himself on the side of the car, his nose a mess. He was beat to sheet, still holding the baseball bat point talking it out at home, and with the cops and people from our high school the next day, a reconstruction of what we got, caught in that night became pretty easy point Chris is from a first generation German family, red hair and all. He defied his mother that night, and went out skating with us without permission. However she hadn't come home until late. When she arrived home, and didn't see him, she knew exactly where he would be. She angrily drove to find us the mob was part of some Hispanic gang in the projects, who, earlier that week had determined that the part of the park was their turf, or whatever the fact that means. Other skaters in the area had been getting in fights with them, and I guess that night they were just camping out, watching us. They sent the two kids out to insult us, thinking we would jump them or something. When we lectured them about the insults, the need for some Cassis belly was satisfied point apparently Chris's mother saw the crowd, but being an angry German mother didn't give a fuck. When the mob attacked us, then she was a double angry German mother mad at her son and mad at the gang point as we were being attacked in the car, she was yelling at them to stop. Some 30 something larger Hispanic girl turned from the car assault and said something insulting, so Chris's mom decked her. Then a man, presumably the boyfriend of said fat girl, seeing this, punched her back. She screamed kicked him in the balls, and then proceeded to beat the sheet out of him. Point our friends had called the police as soon as they bolted in their car. Upon seeing the police arrive, the mob had bolted, all except for the guy who had attacked Chris's mom, me, her, and Chris. He had to go to the hospital, but wasn't too beat up. I wasn't even really scratched, and he wouldn't have been either had he stayed in the car. That was in 1997. Chris died in a helicopter crash in Iraq serving our country in 2008. I still regret not getting out of the car with him and getting Myers B2.0 LDR. As teenagers, we got mooed at then jumped by a fact ton of people from the projects. My friend's German mom showed up and beat some dudes as. My friend, let's call her Mary, invited me over when we were 16 so we could sneak out and go to a party. I was excited, it was my first time, and it was going to be fun. The living room was crawling with people dancing to loud music and everyone was drinking. After about 10 minutes at the party I was done with the whole scene. I dragged my friend from the guy she was making out with and forcibly dragged her out the back door, yelling we are leaving right the hell now. The guy wasn't going to give up, so I looked at another jock and yelled, that guy just called you a bussy, you should punch his lights out. The completely wasted jock believed me and took a swing as the guy. 
we didn't stick around long enough to see what happened. Ran through the backyard, over a small fence, and into a neighbor's yard. We stopped under a tree to catch our breath and Mary puked. She'd had way more than beer, but I didn't know what it was. About 30 seconds later cops swarmed the place. Turns out it was a hardcore drug house that was absolutely getting busted that night and the guy had slipped my friend something. He was a date rapist and was trying to get Mary and me point Mary didn't want to go home and started to cry. So I half carried Mary to her house and said we'd gone out for a walk and Mary was sick. It was the flu from school. Her dad probably didn't believe a word I said but let us back into the house, made sure we were okay and let Mary sleep it off. We never snuck out again to party. Okay, so the words no time to explain, let's go were not uttered, but, high school. There was a blizzard which is pretty uncommon around where I lived. I decided that I should just stay at a friend's house the night before, since there was no way there would be school the next day. Lol, southern snow. The next morning we awoke to a faking winter wonderland. So awesome. We derped around playing video games until around 4pm. GD outcast LAN party son. Then there was a knock on the door this was another one of our friends. This guy was sort of bad news. Drank, smoked, got high with Sudafed. He looked at us both and said we are going on a pilgrimage to Mecca. We looked at each other, shrugged and got ready to go. When we got outside we saw that he had two of our other friends with him and we set off to wherever he was leading us. We derped through the fields toward the school, throwing snowballs, being brothers, until we decided to brave the giant playground nearby. When we got there the snow had begun dumping on us again. Around dusk we noticed that we had no idea where we were thanks to the snow and looming darkness. We wandered around for about an hour or two, and then our fearless expedition leader found the bathroom building. We broke in, stupid padlock, and started a fire with toilet paper in a trash can in the middle of the boys bathroom. We stayed there for at least another hour, while the snow died down again. When we emerged, we realized that we had gone in a meandering circle of about 2 to 3 miles, for no good reason. The parking lot and street were about 1 quarter miles away. Point good times TLDR, group of teenagers on an expedition in a blizzard. This will get buried, but oh well point, when I was 16, me and two of my friends used our fake IDs to sneak into a strip club. A woman asked me if I wanted a dance, so I asked her how much, and she tells me $20. I have a $20 on me, so why not? We sit down with about 30 seconds left in a song, and she starts dancing. Next song starts, and she keeps going. Now, I assume that this is all one dance, but stripper math always trumps logic. She says that will be $40. I told her that was only one dance and I only had $20 on me. She gets the bouncer, who grabs me by the shoulders and drags me over to the ATM. As I'm taking out another $20, the stripper is yelling at me, telling the bouncer how I'm trying to rip her off. ETC point I finally give her the $20, she sticks it in her garter and walks away. I catch my friend's eye, wave them over, and say no time to explain, but we need to go now. Be faking cool, when? The stripper stuck my $20 in her garter, her whole wad for the night had come loose. I put my foot on top of the cash, picked it up as smoothly as I could, and walked out the front door. Made out with around $200 plus my original $40 point. If she hadn't been such a beach and tried to rip me off, I would have never done something like that. But at the time, it seemed like the right thing to do. This one wasn't as funny as it was scary. My friends and I were smoking weed on top of my school. I know, I know, stupid teenagers, and who would have thunk it? A couple cops show up point now our school is situated practically in the middle of a park. So being the stupid teenagers we were, we jump off of the building, tuck, and roll, then start booking it with the logic the sun is starting to go down, they won't be able to find us. Keep in mind at the point we are at a good. 7 so we make our way into the park thinking we are all smart slash bad as for outrunning the cops. So we are strolling through the park, and who do you think we see? If you guessed a cop, you're a champion point well when we see, said cop we take off in the opposite direction. At this point we are running down a paved path through dense woods with the school to our right and some soccer fields to our left. 
we make the smart decision and head towards the soccer fields. Why is this smart you might ask? Because there is a neighborhood in which we had friends right across for them. So we ran. And when I say we ran I mean I have never ran this fast in my life point predictably, while running across the soccer fields one of the cops spots us and gives chase. Now this cop was not your average in shape cop. I mean this guy looked like a walrus shuffling across a beach. Thinking we were alright for a moment we slow our pace and begin to ponder whose house to go to. About the time we enter the neighborhood from the soccer fields, there was a path through a line of trees to get to it, we hear a helicopter we immediately exchange looks of pure terror. We knew now that there were only two options, get caught and serve jail time, or somehow make a James Bond styled escape. You can guess which one we chose. Luckily for us our friend's house was only a block or two down the road we were now on, so we sprinted to it, occasionally ducking in some bushes, when we heard a vent the slightest helicopter sounds or a car come by. Upon arriving at his house we throw open the front door and slam it behind us my friend, let's call him Alex, runs down from his room upstairs, yelling the whole time. We explain the story to him, and being one of our best friends, and a bigger thrill seeker than any of us. He joins without thinking. We decide the best thing to do is jump in his car and get as far away from there as possible against stupid freaking teenagers. Whilst driving through his neighborhood we see a good 8 to 10 cops, bear in mind this neighborhood is 80 to 100 houses at the most. As we are coming to the entrance we are surprised to find the police are checking cars on their way out of the neighborhood. At this point we are all thinking it's game over, we lost. But Alex had one final idea, hide in the odd amount of blankets he had in his trunk, he drove and sov, so we proceeded to cover ourselves in what seemed like hundreds of blankets as we pulled up to the checkpoint we were thoroughly hidden in blankets, we heard him roll down his window and start talking to the officer. The officer explains that they were looking for two boys, described what we were wearing, etc. It's at this point that the officer notices the inordinate amount of blankets in the back of Alex's car and begins getting curious. From nowhere Alex tells the officer of a program he started at school that was giving blankets to the poor who needed them and added that he was on his way to get even more. The officer clearly sounded skeptical but let him by. After another 10 or so minutes we finally come out of the blankets and start celebrating with weed. I never found out what the hell those blankets were doing back there, TLDR, smoking weed on my school with my friend, we proceed to lead the police on a chase through a park and neighborhood and end up getting away with some help from a friend who lived in the neighborhood. When I was 17 I was house sitting for a friend of my parents a few of my friends came over and we decided to smoke a little weed. A half hour or so passed and we were all pretty baked and we decided to watch a movie. We decided to watch Edward Scissorhands, because I heard that was awesome to watch, when you're stoned point we are all settled in with some snacks, and watching the movie, when the phone rings. The people I was house sitting for had a pretty large house and the phone was all the way across the room, so I just let the phone ring, the answering switched on, hi, you've reached the herb terps, and we can't come to the phone right now, so leave a message, the machine beeps and then we get a few minutes of recorded dial tone. Really that's no big deal, it happens all the time on answering machines. The situation became a little tense though when the phone just started ringing over and over again, and the same dial tone would be recorded on the answering machine. These phone calls kept coming all throughout the movie, but we just all ignored them, not our house, not our problem. The move is over, and our collective buzz has pretty well subsided, but the phone calls keep coming. Finally, I go and pick up the phone. I pick up the phone and say herp derp residents, the voice on the other end growls a sharp get out into my ear. As a sheet eating 17 year old I suspect right away that this is one of my dumbest friends playing a joke on us. I tell the rest of the guys what happened and they all laughed. We continued on with the festivities and the phone just keeps ringing. We all take turns picking up the phone and every time the voice says the same thing, get. Out after almost all of us have had a turn picking up the phone we start to get a little spooked. My dad is a police officer and give him a call. I tell him about the phone calls and he's a bit weirded out too. He assures me it's no big deal and probably someone playing a joke. Your dad being a cop has certain advantages my dad tells me to keep everyone in the house and he would go talk with some of his colleagues. About 20 minutes later he calls me back 
and screams into the phone, son, just get your friends out of the house right now and come home immediately, I tried to ask him what was going on, but he interrupted me again and just told me to come home. Luckily, we were clear headed enough to drive home. I drove us all to my house, and when I came home my dad was standing by my mom at the kitchen table. My mom's eyes were red from crying, and my dad was trying to comfort her. They both looked really relieved when I came through the door. I asked my dad what was up, and he looked at me with the most sober face I've ever seen and said, the calls were coming from inside the house. There was guy I used to work with, and he was more than a little weird. It wasn't the quirky, zany, kind of charming weirdness, but just straight up uncomfortable. He tried to befriend me, because I was new to the staff and no one else talked to him point in conversation it had come up, that he lived in the same area as me, and he didn't have a car anymore as he said he had just broken up with his girlfriend, and she was the one who owned the car. He managed to pry a lift out of me, and he asked if we could drive by his exes to grab his electronic stuff, TV, Xbox etc, and I said if he could move it by himself and fit it in the boot I would allow it. Point we drove up to this house, and he got out and walked down the long path to the house. The house was one of a series of terraces and looked like utter sheet point a minute or two later I hear shouting and look up to the second floor and see something hit the inside of the window and caused it to crack. My first thought was that I had just driven an angry man to his ex's house so he could kill her. So I sat there for a few seconds trying to work out what to do next. Before I could work out what to do, the guy came sprinting out of the door with a pair of panties and bra in his hand point I probably should have done something to prevent him getting in, but I was so confused. As he opened the door I noticed a very big angry man come out of the same door and shouting something in what sounded like an Eastern European language point as he slammed the door he said the infamous no time to explain. Go. I floored and shot away as the man came running towards the car with a hammer and a knife point. After managing to get enough distance that I thought we were escaped I asked what the fuck was going on. Apparently the woman was not his girlfriend, but was instead a prostitute he had been visiting for 5 months. From the way he described he had become very stalkerish and had proposed to her multiple times. Her pimp, I hate that word but it fits, had warned that if he turned up again he would be killed point because he was missing he was trying to steal her underwear so he could have a part of her near him point tldr helped a man steal a prostitute's underwear and then helped him escape the pimps that wanted him dead. There was guy I used to work with and he was more than a little weird. It wasn't the quirky, zany, kind of charming weirdness but just straight up uncomfortable. He tried to befriend me because I was new to the staff and no one else talked to him point in conversation it had come up that he lived in the same area as me and he didn't have a car anymore as he said he had just broken up with his girlfriend and she was the one who owned the car. He managed to pry a lift out of me and he asked if we could drive by his exes to grab his electronic stuff, TV, Xbox etc and I said if he could move it by himself and fit it in the boot I would allow it point we drove up to this house and he got out and walked down the long path to the house. The house was one of a series of terraces and looked like utter sheet point a minute or two later I hear shouting and look up to the second floor and see something hit the inside of the window and caused it to crack. My first thought was that I had just driven an angry man to his ex's house so he could kill her. So I sat there for a few seconds trying to work out what to do next. Before I could work out what to do, the guy came sprinting out of the door with a pair of panties and bra in his hand point I probably should have done something to prevent him getting in, but I was so confused. As he opened the door I noticed a very big angry man come out of the same door and shouting something in what sounded like an Eastern European language. As he slammed the door he said the infamous no time to explain. Go. I floored and shot away as the man came running towards the car with a hammer and a knife point. After managing to get enough distance that I thought we were escaped I asked what the fuck was going on. Apparently the woman was not his girlfriend, but was instead a prostitute he had been visiting for 5 months. From the way he described he had become very stalkerish and had proposed to her multiple times. Her pimp, I hate that word but it fits, had warned that if he turned up again he would be killed point because he was missing he was trying to steal her underwear 
so he could have a part of her near him. Point TLDR helped a man steal a prostitute's underwear and then helped him escape the pimps that wanted him dead. When I was 10, I was living in a house that my stepdad had completely renovated. I mean it was an all lights, no toilet piece of crap, but after a while it was looking good. Only problem was my step wasn't the type of guy to give a single fuck about health and safety regulations and whacked a gas canister used for our oven about 10 feet away from a wood burning stove point so one night my real dad came over to spend the weekend with his children. We are about to tuck into a some food when all of a sudden there's a loud bang, and I kid you not, the gas was steaming out of its canister so quickly you could see it point thank god an adult was around. Luck is all that kept is his four children alive that day, he very quickly figured out the consequences of what was about to happen, and roared like I had never hear anyone roar, everyone get the fuck out now, I was so scared that I didn't even get my shoes and was outside in about 5 seconds. My family followed, another 10 seconds later there was an even louder explosion, where the gas had finally penetrated the stove point the house was completely on fire about 5 minutes later, to be honest no one was hurt, and we got a good insurance payout and actually managed to move into a nice house as a consequence, but fuck it was scary. Fair to say that my dad saved my life and it still haunts me thinking about what would have happened if we'd all been in bed point tldr. Dad anticipates a gas explosion at home about 15 seconds before sheet got real. Shouts for all of us to bail. Saved his four children's lives edit. Formatting. Best I've got. Working in the human resources service center for a major bank. I was a temp stuck in a sort of back corner room with a few other temps where we had one big window that looked out over the parking lot. Very hot summer day. I look up at one point and see smoke drifting past the window. I'm not sure why, but my first thought was that someone's car might be on fire. My good friend there, who eventually became my sister-in-law, was nearby at the time, but did not see the smoke. Wind dispersed it. I jumped up, looked over at her and said, outside. Quick. She doesn't question. We just ran through the back door and out into the parking lot, where it turns out some dumb beach were throwing cigarette butts into the wood chips there. I worked on shoving the dirt around and putting the fire out with my feet while my friend ran back inside, coming back out a moment later with someone else who had a fire extinguisher. The women who threw the cigarettes just stood there staring the whole time. Luckily one of the cars parked right there belonged to one of the culprits and it got a bunch of the extinguisher foam all over it point same place. We also rescued a baby snake from getting stomped once, was less of a quick don't ask questions and more of a bunch of women screeching like banshees while my future sister-in-law and I sit there going all well. TLDR stopped a cigarette fire from spreading. Also, baby snake. Alright, so this isn't too heroic. But I swear my life on it point. So I have had a really great friend for ages who, a few years ago, slowly started sinking into depression. He had made the choice to take a job that paid well, but was at a power plant. So it was not exactly a really challenging experience, his recollection not my prejudice. In fact he was like the first new hire in years, and while he's a really enigmatic and kind guy, the rest of the people he worked with were hyper-masculine dutcher bags. Physically, he's a pretty built guy, in fact he's a head taller than me, and pretty muscular anyways. We'd been living in different cities talking to each other basically every night, as his job kept him on the premises from 6pm to 6am, and I was a student who had fac all to do anyways at night, and I was beginning to suspect that he was falling into a really bad place. He was so sad that I had become convinced that he was depressed. So I took a 2 hour trip to go see him. We had a few drinks and decided to head to a party in the tiny town near his power plant. No worries no drunk driving was involved. Well we ended up taking the long way, a scenic route which went past the power plant where he worked point he was in the middle of laying out how shitty he felt life becoming because of the wretched plant. So I said, you know what, you need to tell this plant to fuck off. So I pulled into the plant, it was about 1am and the place appeared to be deserted. I told him to get out of the car as I pulled into the gravel parking lot we then proceeded to yell obscenities at the plant, and then, for the hell of it, he was like, hit me, being, in the heat of the moment, telling me what his heart meant, I socked him in the jaw. 
he said do it again so I did, and again, and again, as I was punching him, he was just screaming fuck you, you soul sucking hellhole. Kind of lost in it, I started tearing up, and so did he, so eventually the situation had turned into two guys screaming, crying, and beating the shit out of each other in a parking lot. Point funny thing about 9 over 11, apparently power plants now have army staff on the premises to prevent terrorism point year point so halfway into the midst of a good beatdown, I look up and see a freaking hummer coming our way point I cease punching. My friend and grab him by the collar, pulling him towards the car. As he writes himself, he's noticeably confused, and I said the words, no time to explain, get in the car, he was stunned but scrambled into my car and we tore out of there taking every back street we could to get to the party we were supposed to be at point later he told be that when he went back to work, he found that the video was floating around via email, and while nobody figured out it was him, he's fairly certain his boss thought it was. Working at a residential treatment home for kids, closing time, and we are waiting for late night staff to come in. There are four of us. Myself, two new staff, and another employee of comparable experience to me. We keep the radios low when the clients are asleep. I kept just one on really low on the desk next to me when I hear, code, green, all available staff, a wall from the north hospital, fact point me, sheet, we got a roll. Dude, referring to the other old staff, take the floor, you two, on me, and, we bolted, yelled orders on the way. Kid is heading for the highway. One if you get to the gourd shack, right? Says the female newbie, and she makes the left out the first door. You, get to the north hospital. The other kids will probably be rioting. Get there and look for anyone in a black shirt. They can instruct you further. Use your radio, and call for more staff on the way. Okay, and... And that guy's gone point turns out the unit rioted first, so very few staff got outside. To find the a wall point I meet up with the first newbie staff out in the main road heading for the highway. We are walking quietly listening for the a wall client. I see a kid sprinting through a field right next to the road before she does. I toss her my radio and give chase. Get. A van. I yelled. Catch up to the kid quick. And initiated a solo restraint six minutes go by. Girl has wounds on her arm and bare feet. As she was going to the highway to jump into traffic. Van pulls up. And three staff jump out to assist point TLDR, a wall from a children's mental hospital. Me and two new staff went to assist. I yelled orders at full sprint, and restrained a possible suicide victim point edited for spelling errors. Typing on a phone. I had just finished the first dive of the day off of Pantanizac, Mexico. The boat carrying my father, brother, and three other divers was now heading full speed towards the next dive site. Unfortunately the wind was strong, and created a lot of chop on the surface of the ocean. The ride was rocky and sea spray was everywhere. To keep myself warm, I kept on my wetsuit point suddenly, the Mexican deckhands all rushed to the bow of the boat. These guys never rush, they were Mexican deckhands. I immediately paid attention point they started pointing to the water about 50 yards in front of the boat at about 1 o'clock. From the rear, I tried to make out what they were pointing at. No luck. As the boat sped forward, the objects in the water began to come closer and closer. We are about to pass them. Suddenly, I hear one of them yell, Delphine, wild, dolphins. Off the right side of our speeding boat point not a chance to be missed point I grabbed the closest things to me, my fins and my mask. No snorkel, no vest, no tank, no weights. Without thinking I pulled the mask around my neck. Tucked the fins under my arm, and leaped off the side of the speeding boat. Just before hitting the tumultuous water, I turned in the air, and met my father's gaping stare. Come. On. I screamed point I hit the sea with a rush, foam and white bubbles blocking my view. I donned my mask, cleared it of water, strapped on my fins. I put my head up, to see who was with me point no one point the boat had slid away from me, after they killed the engines. As I watched them slow down, I saw my father and brother jump in lazily. Then I saw the deckhands rush towards me. They were waving their hands. Away. Keep going. That's what they meant. The dolphins were further out point I swam like mad. With my head down in the water, my arms folded in at my sides, and no snorkel. I had to turn my head to the side to breathe. 
I felt like a torpedo seeking out its target. Eventually I stopped. There was nothing. Not even the sound of my breath. Just blue water and my beating heart. I looked back towards the boat. I could make out the rest of the dive group, still more than 40 yards away. I looked back down in the water there they were. Two bottlenose dolphin, swimming directly below me, turned to one side to eye me. I swam with them and above them. They were so fast. With seemingly no effort they glided through the water. I followed and followed, and eventually they slid away into the depths. I stopped, frantically looking around below me. I turned around and around like a top. Then, I saw one, directly below me, as before. But where was the other? I looked up point she was directly in front of me, vertically suspended in the water column. Her head was bent, both eyes staring at me, like members of two opposing tribes, facing off in an open field point we stared at each other point she slid down to her friend. They looked at me one last time, and they swam away point minutes seemed to pass, after I was left alone. Thought it must have been second Zyros my head out of the water. I was a good 100 yards from the boat, now, and no one else had come to join me. I gave them the biggest diver ok signal I could manage, and swam back to the boat point. When I got there, the deckhands had crowded the edge of the boat and were shouting, fins, fins, wit, they wanted my fins. I grabbed onto the side of the vessel, peeled them off, and handed them to a deckhand. As I pulled myself up onto the boat, he turned to me and said, you swim fast. Must have magic fins. No, I just wanted to see the dolphin. He turned to his friends and laughed. Airs loco. So I wake up around 3am, because my dad is yelling with all his might, grab something and follow me. No time to explain. So I get the fuck out of bed, and chase my dad out the front door. I see that he picked up some sort of stick, and as I'm still not fully awake I grab a huge wooden board. We get down to our garage, the lights are on, and my moped is missing. Custom built death machine. We start running down the road barefooted, my father is completely naked, and I'm only wearing boxers. When we reach a bend in the road, I see two guys walking with a bike, and two other guys loading some equipment into their car. My father yells from the top of his lungs, where the fuck do you think you're going, and starts running for the car which is closest. I start chasing the two guys with my moped, without thinking about them being twice my size, but for some reason they ditch the bike and start running. I run back towards my father, who is violently hitting a car with a stick. The car is locked, and containing two frightened teenagers, who can't get the car started, as they are obviously busy sheeting bricks. The stick isn't doing much damage, so my father rips the large board out of my hand, and before they get the car started, he manages to break the front window, which collapses onto the two boys. Two side windows exploding with glass. The rear window of the car also explodes in a sea of glass. We don't catch any of them, and even though we reported the incident, we never heard anything. Oddly enough a couple of towns over, a whole street of cars were vandalized that night, so I'm guessing they borrowed the car from one of their parents also my dad had diabetes, and got a cut in his foot from the glass. A combination of diabetes, a blood disease and a cut in the foot, resulted in my dad having his foot cut off through surgery point I found out who one of the guys were a couple of years later, and I have never beaten as much living sheet out of a guy, as I did, when I met that faker. Doesn't replace my father's foot, but the vengeance was awesome. A couple of years ago, my brother and I were very into geocaching, which is like a scavenger hunt where people post GPS coordinates of caches in public areas that contain a logbook and sometimes a few trinkets to exchange. The cache owner usually lists a couple of clues, and the payoff is in finally finding the hidden loot after an hour of poking around in the underbrush. Point one fateful afternoon, I noticed that a new cache had been posted in a nearby rock quarry that was mined a century ago to build the local dam, and is now part of a 200 acre nature preserve. My brother decided to tag along, and we set off from the parking lot with Garmin device in hand. There are 4 or 5 trails in this park, some of which lead up hills, and others by a lake, but all eventually lead to the quarry. After 20 minutes of wandering with only the GPS to guide us, we came into a clearing, and saw the quarry rock formation up ahead. The GPS said we were only about 200 feet away from the general location of the cache, 
so we started to climb up the rocks and search in crevices for the cache. I remember noticing that the afternoon light was fading and the wind had picked up, but I was too focused on the task at hand to think much of it point after only a few minutes of searching, I received a call from my dad, I just saw a weather alert for tornadoes and hail in the area, I hope you guys aren't outside. It was only then that I looked up at the sky beyond the quarry and saw a massive row of dark clouds approaching. Out of the handful of oh sheet moments I have had in my life, this was the most ominous. Without bothering to explain, I yelled to my brother that we had to get the fuck out of Dodge and we hastily made our way down to the quarry floor and headed back to the trail point the first drops of rain began to fall as we entered the forest again. In our haste we took a wrong turn and ended up on an unfamiliar trail, but I knew by the markings that it would eventually lead us back to the parking lot. Until that point I had kept relatively calm, but suddenly the rain got heavier and I heard a sound that I will never forget. The wind picked up dramatically, and the collective rustling of the trees created a noise like a roaring waterfall, far away at first but then rapidly approaching. Our brisk walk turned into a jog, and I could see the tops of the trees start to sway violently. All of a sudden, there was a loud cracking noise from above that stopped us in our tracks. I looked up just in time to see the upper third of the 50 foot tree in front of us begin to fall away, and before I could process what was happening it fell across the path 3 feet in front of us. Another couple of steps forward, and we would have been crushed point. That was when the full on panic hit. My brother and I exchanged, looks of we are going die, aren't we, and without a word, started an adrenaline fueled sprint along the path back to the parking lot 10 minutes later we arrived at the car, and peeled out, just as the hail started point I'm a little more careful now about checking the weather, before I go out. In college two of us at work one night closing shift of dirtway when a friend slides into the gravel parking lot, jumps out of his car, and runs into the store telling both of us, we have to go help him liberate a football goalpost. We had 4 hours left on our shift, but without another thought, scrawled some random note on the door, locked everything down, rounded up some keys to the stadium from the marching band director, who only vaguely questioned why we were needing his keys at 10.30 at night. The 8 of us got to work acquiring the torn down goalpost, because come to find out another group of guys on campus was after it as well, we had just won a football game against our biggest in state rivals. Arrived at the stadium parked with my friend's truck back down the ramp to the field, and turned on every light we had access to, tossed every instrument in our equipment room just out in front of the gate, to make it appear we had a legit reason for being at the stadium late at night. My friend and I stayed up top working at the gate as our opponents for the torn down goalpost drove by multiple times, we gave them big stinking waves on each pass, until they gave up. Six of our recruited comrades were down on the field cutting the goalpost into three almost manageable pieces with only a couple of hacksaws, using multiple replacement blades, and a lone can of WD-40. While all of deck construction was going on down on the field campus police stopped by not once but twice, once via bike cop, and once in a patrol car asking us what my friend and I were doing. Now being that the derp way my friend and I worked at was across the street from campus the guys were always coming in for meals, so we knew them, they knew us and always thankfully explained away in a reasonable manner. Finally the upright piece that goes in the field has been cut from horizontal crossbar and the crossbar is now cut into two sections. Our first trip away from the stadium with one of the three pieces loaded into my friend's truck with a fair amount of the neon yellow post hanging over the back just barely covered up at 1 or 2 in the morning. We are home free, we made it. When the lights fire up red and blue, and over the loudspeaker we hear, hey, turn your lights on. We do, the red and blue go off, and we are on our way two trips later after almost cheating ourselves, after seeing the cops turn on their lights at 3 in the morning we have most of a division 1 football goalpost. While driving to my friend's house in high school, I roll up to a stop sign, and come to a complete stop, like a concerned citizen. It's the middle of August and my defective heater won't turn off, so my window is rolled down. As I'm about to proceed, a woman has her head in my driver's side window inches from my face and screams, I know this is crazy, but could you please drive me around the corner, please? It was crazy, so crazy that I happily obliged, as I was 16 and completely stunned about what just happened. 
I take this woman around the corner, and she says, okay, wait right here, I'll be back in a minute. Why did I stay? I still have no idea, but I'm glad that I did. A few moments later, I see her emerge from a house holding a stroller under one arm and a small child under the other, as she screamed, pop the trunk, pop the trunk. She throws her things in the trunk and gets in the car when suddenly a man comes out of the house with a baseball bat and is bellowing something or other as I tear off into the night. She tells me to drop her at the train station and at this point I'm so invested and have lethal amounts of adrenaline in my body that I scream back, I can't take you there, are you insane? That's only a few blocks away. He'll find you there for sure. I end up driving her across town to one of her friend's house while she explains the situation and thanks me for the ride, the kid just looking peacefully out the window. And that is when I decided to fix my air conditioner TLDR, I enthusiastically helped a woman kidnap her own child. I was at club during my phase of sex and drugs. I was into ecstasy and cocaine at the time. Life was crazy, but I still had good friends that I partied with, knew the guys running the club and never had any trouble, knew the girls and had fun with them also. I had just taken a blue dolphin and called up my buddy to see what he was doing. Normally I would have bought from him, but he only sold Mali and I felt like having a hard pill roll. Well what occurred over the phone was a bit of a shock especially after just starting to get the kick from the pill. I just hear him yelling about grabbing stuff and saying he couldn't talk right now. I asked if I should come get him and the phone went dead point I knew something was up but there was nothing I could really do. I was rolling my balls off and didn't want to have a bad trip. I smoked a bowl with one of the bouncers and hit the dance floor next thing I knew I was turned around by my friends. Let's call him Johnny. Girlfriend saying Johnny is outside and we need you. I just said okay and out the door I went. I jump in the car and there is a strange person sitting next to me, and Johnny starts to drive off. They have a radio going on turned into the police scanner stations. I hear his vehicle being mentioned. He tells me his supplier was just busted, and he's been informed that Johnny was named as his supplier I guess to keep his real guy from being busted. Upon hearing this Johnny started freaking out, and was about to flush all his stuff till I called him. He then decided to come get me and give me a present $20,000 worth of cocaine and X. He handed me a box and dropped me off at a hotel. He said to go get a room and wait for a call because he had some people that needed to be taken care of. Now this is all while I'm high as hell rolling my balls off point wheel I get the hotel room and go wait. Check the goods. Everything is here scales, drugs, even vitamin B bottles to cut the coke with. I get a call a few minutes later from a girl I didn't know saying that Johnny and told them to contact me. Well I invite them up and turns out to be three gorgeous girls who happen to be strippers. I won't go into the rest of the story but needless to say it was a damn good night where pretty much anything you can imagine happened point the police eventually caught up to him and he was able to play it off that he just always bought a little stuff from the guy who got busted. He was watched for a while and interrogated. We didn't keep contact for a while. I had a police officer come by my work once asking about him, but they weren't really too interested in talking to me since most of our contact wasn't ever through the phone and told them I only contacted him from working with him at a part-time job point best part being I never was asked to pay him back or anything. He gave me all that stuff and said he was done. He left town and we stayed in contact for a while but have gone our separate ways. And now I don't do anything besides smoking pot. This happened Thanksgiving this past year. My whole family was at my brother's place the night before the Feast of Kings. My parents slept in the living room and I was in the basement. So there I was up late with my lady on Skype when suddenly my brother came down the stairs to the basement telling me to get off the computer there was a man he didn't know sleeping on the floor in the living room right where my parents were. Now of course him being the troll brother he tends to be I thought this was just some kind of joke. But he persisted. Dude seriously come upstairs quick we need you to help just in case I'm not joking. I'm a big manly man. So I told my girl brb my brother is trollin'. 
I go upstairs with my brother and sure as fact there's a man whom I've never seen before sleeping on the floor while my parents are on the couch about a foot away awakened and in a daze by what was going on point so me and my brother made the decision to just call the cops. What choice did we have? Guy could have been crazy. So the cops get there and try to wake the guy up. Sir. Sir. Wake up. Sheriff's department. When he didn't respond the cops thought it would be a good idea to just manhandle the guy to put the cuffs on him while he was still sleeping. Big mistake. He started resisting and getting violent and physical while at the same time yelling no grandpa no. It hurts grandpa facko fff. This went on for a good 5 minutes my mother had ran upstairs for safety and me and my brother just stood there freaked out and a little amused. Apparently the man was trying to get home from a party and was extremely drunk. He knocked on the front door thinking it was his dad's place which was nearby and my dad who had thought it was my brother coming home late from work just lets this guy in. My dad has some medical issues that makes him extremely abnormally groggy. When he first wakes up, the cops finally subdued him and took him away. The guy who we later found out was in some sort of drunk sleepwalking episode. The thing that bothered me the most is that when the guy came in he stole the pillow from under my mother's head and also took the spare blanket from under her as well. Poor mom. The whole experience made it the most memorable Thanksgiving ever. Wish I had been recording it. This fits the no time to explain mostly. One night I walked out my front door around midnight to walk my dog before bed and found a guy sitting in the shadow of a tree in my front yard. He was facing away from me, looking towards my neighbor's front door I walked up behind him and said hey man, what are you doing out here? He turned and looked at me over his shoulder, then turned back around, like he is going to ignore me. I asked him again. Dude, what are you doing in my front yard this late at night? This is when he slowly starts standing up. I notice that he is helping himself up with something dark. I couldn't make it out at first, but then I realized it was actually a black rifle with a scope. He turned and looked at me, rifle in hand, and just stared at me silently. He appeared as though he was trying to come up with an excuse. I kind of put my hands up to indicate that I was not a threat to him and said what the fuck are you doing in my yard with a gun. He mumbled something that was barely audible that started with I'm gonna kill that and I couldn't understand the rest. He then turned and started jogging down the street towards the front of my neighborhood. I called 911. As soon as he got outside of hearing distance point in retrospect I realized this was stupid but I followed him to see where he would go. He eventually turned a corner in my neighborhood and I couldn't see him anymore. I decided to stop following and started making my way back home. All the while I was on the phone with 911 giving his whereabouts, what he was doing, wearing, etc. Shortly after turning to head back home, I looked behind me and about 200 yards away was the guy running towards me with a rifle, with a scope. I finally came to my senses and thought about the fact that he could shoot me from anywhere given that he had a scope and he almost certainly knew at this point that I was on the phone with the cops and he knew exactly where I lived. I immediately told the 911 dispatcher that I needed to hang up with them and call my wife who was asleep to tell her to lock the doors and not let anyone in. The dispatcher didn't want me to hang up but I told them I would call right back. I called my wife, waking her up. She is immediately pissed off course, wondering why on earth I'm calling her and waking her up if I'm in the same house as her. The conversation goes something like this. Me, babe, I don't have time to explain. Run downstairs and lock all the doors. Don't let anyone in her. Groggy, what, what are you talking about? Me, I don't have time. Just do it. Lock the doors her. Why? What's going on? Me. There is a guy outside with a gun. Just lock the damn door sir. What? Where are you? Me. Outside. I've got to go. I need to call 9. Double one back like I can imagine. My wife was freaked the hell out. First post ever here on reddit. Hi guys. Okay so this is about 7 years ago. I was 21 at the time. I was working for my father who was the manager of our Montreal office for a big corporation. It's the summer seminar, which means that all the bosses get to go in an all-inclusive resort somewhere and be pampered for a week. My mom usually got to go, but she couldn't that year, and since I was working for him, he decided to take me. 
The resort was in Arizona, two hours from Phoenix. It was a pretty big deal to me, since I never really traveled before, and never been in a desert, coming from Canada. I knew I was going to be bored a little, since I was the youngest by at least 10 years. So my days were pretty much me getting drunk on hash 7 by the pool. One afternoon that I managed to get myself particularly plastered, just hanging out in the pool, when suddenly a wild company CEO appears. He tells me he has an appointment for a massage in 5 minutes, but doesn't want to go, asked if I wanted to go instead of him, so I said yes. I never had a professional massage before. All I remember is laying there naked on the table with a towel over my parts and the girl massaging my chest. I feel asleep because of the booze. I woke up about an hour later, alone in the room, pitching a tent with the towel. I got up, put my swimming suit and whiffer beater back on, and left the building, walking around all relaxed and drunk. My dad comes running to me and says I'll exit it, en fin te voila. Sus moi vite, which means here you are. Follow me quick, in French. I follow him to a limo parked outside the lobby. I get in, at which point he hands my a ticket and says, we are going to see ZZ Top in Phoenix. Have a drink. Show rocked. My father bought us matching t-shirts, and he bought me jackal. I'm lactose intolerant, but it was my birthday, so I decided to indulge in some cheesy goodness in the form of Italian food for dinner. Now usually when I consume large amounts of dairy I'm good until the next morning. Knowing that I head over to a local dive bar to meet up with friends to get silly. After about a pitcher of beer and a few well drinks I feel a familiar rumble in my tummy, a rumble that I wasn't expecting until about 6am the next morning. Now, when I say dive bar I mean only Bud Light or Coors Light, it's $2.75 for rum and cokes, it's California Bud Up, until about 2 years ago no one care if you smoked inside or not, darts league, 2 shootings outside the bar, since I've been frequenting it, some lady from the neighborhood would regularly smoke meth in the shed in the patio and there are no doors to be found in the men's room. Literally, you if you were at the pool tables you have a full on view of the men's toilet. Obviously I'm not going to take a dump there. I live only about 10 minutes away. I tell my friends I'm going to find a nicer room and excuse myself. I'm driving and nothing is open. What's worse is that I pulled into a couple gas stations and a Starbucks hoping to use the restroom and you know how when really need to go, and you know you're close to a restroom, so your body subconsciously starts to prepare for the impending poop train by pushing all your fecal waste to the front door, that happened three times. So pretty much I'm bursting at the seams leaving the Starbucks parking lot, so I decide the best thing to do is go home, drop a deuce, and then head back. I'm driving home, and I don't think I'm going to make it. But my cousin lives way closer to where I'm coming from, so I call him and tell him that I'm headed over and to have the door unlocked and make sure no one is in the restroom. About a minute later, it felt like it was a hour. I pull into his driveway, run through his front door, run through the living room into the restroom and proceed to release the most vile, noisy, wet half poop slash half diarrhea I've ever pushed out of my bottom in my adult life. Think dumb and dumber, legs in the air, face going full derp. After everything is expelled I finally relax, wipe the sweat from my bro, and bring my breathing back to normal. I wipe flush, lift up the toilet seat, because I know there was backsplash and clean the underside of the seat as well, flush again and wash my hands. I walk out of the restroom, all smiles, and see that my uncle who was visiting from out of the country and staying with my cousin was sitting in the living room with two friends. Initially, they're all looking at me with the same look of horror, before trying to smile and greet me. My uncle just gives me the look of disapproval, while my cousin is laughing in the kitchen. I told them that I was sick before heading back to the bar. It was the heady rockster days of the early 1980s. I was 13, smoked pot and cigarettes that I paid for by taking coupons for free packs from the newspapers meant for my paper route and one could still buy a box of matchbooks in the grocery store for about 75 cents. No questions asked point I was in my room after school when I heard a furious pounding on the sliding glass door downstairs. I ran down to discover two of the neighborhood kids wild eyed, panting, and freaking out like jackrabbits in Greyhound station bathroom. Hurry, your little brother's in trouble. 
Come on. I assumed he was being beaten up. Probably by someone I'd been in trouble with. I'd recently been protecting a couple of mentally challenged kids from a Chinese gang at my school, and the gang weren't too happy with me, so I followed them. Point it was summer, and the grass was tall, dry, and slick under our sneakers. I smelled smoke as we ran up the levee that protects the town from the polluted waters of the Sacramento River. We crested the levee and headed down the other side to a spot where kids from my apartment complex hung out, and there in the clearing was my 10-year-old brother staring at a circle of flame he'd created in the grass with my matches taken from the stash in my room. The circle was about 8 feet in diameter and spreading fast. Without really thinking about anything other than the trouble we'd all be in shortly, I leaped into the center of the fire and started stamping the flames. Luckily dried grass burns quickly, so I only had the edges to worry, since the center was mostly burned out point in 10 minutes, with some eventual help from the three stupefied kids, we had it under control. A few minutes later it was out, and we were safe. I chastised my brother harshly for going in my room and stealing my matches, and, as an afterthought, for setting the fire. I eventually made him buy me a new pair of shoes, to replace the pair with the melted soles, and I may or may not have blackmailed him over the incident for years to come. I had just gone to bed on a Friday night at around 3am, after drinking for the better part of 8 hours. Suddenly I hear a pounding on my door and my friend yelling dude, dude, done, wake up, so. I ran to answer it, and he says pack your sheet. We're leaving right now. Just trust me. This was my freshman year of college, and I was more concerned with adventures than academics, so I threw some shirts and a pair of shorts into my backpack, and we started walking to the parking garage. My buddy is still out of breath from sprinting across campus, but manages to blurt between breaths. Britney Spears. My dad skybarks. 14 hours from now. 10 hour drive, his dad was the head of the LSU athletic boosters, and Britney Spears had called to request a box for LSU or burn, but they were all booked up, so he offered her a seat in his private box. My friend's sister had called him earlier that night to tell him, but he'd left his phone in the dorm while we were out gallivanting, so he didn't get the message until 2.30. We drove straight through from Gainesville to Baton Rouge, he was sober, made it there around 2 in the afternoon. Slept for an hour, then got up and went to the game point I should probably mention that this was in 2001 when Britney was still chop your pinky off to screw her heart. So needless to say it was totally worth it. My buddy and I chatted with her on and off for the entire game. She even shook my bat in hand. I still tell myself that she married Kfed after she realized that she already let the best man she'd ever know get away that fateful night in the fall of Ort 1. Friday night of the weekend before spring break my senior year of college. I was hanging out with some friends playing PS2. This was 2003. I had planned to spend all week working on my senior design project, but someone else had other plans. One of my pledge brothers from my fraternity burst through the door and said no time to explain, grab your toothbrush and let's go. So I grabbed my toothbrush and followed. Waiting in his car were the two remaining pledge brothers, as only four from our pledge class were still in school. The others had dropped out. No one said a word as we got on the interstate and headed west. It took me a little while, but I finally figured out what we were doing. During our pledge semester four years previous, one of the things we had to do was drive to South Texas and bury a bottle of whiskey in the desert on this old man's ranch an hour south of a town called Sonora. He was the great uncle of one of our older fraternity brothers. We drove straight there without stopping. 12 hours. We eventually found that bottle of whiskey we had buried. We drank it on our way to Mexico, where we had decided to go, since we were already so close. Spent the week in a sheet hole hotel in a town called Ciudad Acuna, MX. The people down there call it Acunaya. Quite possibly the most fun I have ever had in a week. You college kids out there, you should do something like this that you'll never forget. Maybe not in a Mexican border town, though. I work in a grocery store. I had suspected a customer from stealing from us one day and ever since I was on the lookout for him. It was a Sunday afternoon and he went to the cashier I was helping out with some stuff. He got his money for beer bottles he was returning and went into the store. 
I went to the offices on the second floor, which has a window which overlooks a good part of the store, just to look at what the guy was doing. He went to the pharmacy section and was looking at boxes there. He took one box of medicine and was walking around that section looking at products on the ends of the aisles. He walked down the one he was, the box still in his hand. He disappeared from my view and reappeared 5 to 6 seconds later with no box in his hand but fidgeting around with his coat. There was another assistant manager in the aisle next to the one he was in, so I ran downstairs. Ran up to her and told me to follow me. The guy at this point was nearing the exit and I wanted to make sure to intercept him right before he left so he couldn't be like oh I was heading to the last cashier. I get to him and ask him to open up his jacket. He gives me the usual I didn't do anything, you can't search me. I tell him look, I saw you take a box of medicine and I have you on my cameras, so either you open up your jacket or you can't ever come back here. He keeps saying that he didn't do anything, so I repeat again open up your jacket or never come back here he's leaving for the door at this point and I'm yelling at him, I never want to see you here again. The other assistant manager is looking at me confused and I start explaining to her what happened. She later told me you're always so calm so, when you yelled at me, I just followed you. Next week, I see the guy at the front desk returning beer bottles again. I say to myself, no, he's not that stupid is he? So I go to the desk, he's wearing a cap, so I want to be sure it's him. I see it's him, and I'm like excuse me, you're not allowed to be here anymore he's like, why? I didn't do anything. I say are you serious? I saw you steal from us last week, I have you on camera. Do you want to follow me upstairs, so that I could show you? At this point he's like no, it's okay, haven't seen him since. <laughs> Fuck yes. Story time people. Gather around, this happened around 1999-2001 period. I lived in Nigeria. It was a warm summer evening. Parents taking a nap. Unbeknownst to me, we live 3 kilometers away from a Nigerian army ammo dump. Around 4.30 to 5 p.m., I plugged in my piano adapter into a power outlet for piano practice. And just as I did so, the floor, the building, everything shook violently as fuck. Nevertheless, in my underwear, I woke up my parents and sister and ran the fuck out of my house. We saw exploded shells flying overhead, Mathurfica. Dad quickly ran back inside and grabbed the emergency bag with all our passports etc and some supplies. We took our car and faking scrambled for dear life. We got to the third mainland bridge, 13 kilometers long I think, and from the back of our car we could see huge explosions off in the distance. We had no time to even know what was going on, we just ran the fuck away. The ammo dump blew the fuck up, because some jackers decided it would be good to take a smoke there and throw a cigarette into a pile of grenades. Sadly, a lot of good people died there, around the swamps and whatnot. I remember when we got back to school after that, it was grim, all the windows blown out, even for our residential buildings edit. At first we thought that a gas cylinder filling plant had blown up. That also I have seen happening. Redditor on the other end of the story point driving in Seattle is a beach. If you are going north to south to work, you will either learn an amazing amount of patience or go crazy and become a total as whole. After a year of struggling with road rage, I finally let it all go after a $450 speeding ticket as well. I would do 5 over, stay in the middle lane and block all the fakers out and just do my own thing. I still paid attention, I just no longer took it personal I guess. When some idiot would ride miles obliviously, I would just let off the gas, all the people they passed would pass them again, and they would then be forced to either pass me or continue doing 55 99.9% just weren't paying enough attention to pass or were on the phone point one day, I'm coming home from work, I'm on I-405 around the Bellevue area, in very very surprisingly light traffic, beautiful day, and it's getting dark. I want to pass this car in front, and had been watching traffic behind me for a while. I let all the busy bodies pass, and literally saw lights maybe 4 football fields behind me. I figured I was good point sped up to 65, passed on the left, and before I could pass the 2 2 3 cars following each other, I had a huge truck bearing down on me from nowhere. 
doing the dick thing, weaving back and forth trying to get me to speed up. At this point, I'm almost past the last car anyways, so I shrug it off, signal and get in the middle lane. Wouldn't ya know it, the truck gets behind me and rides my ass. I figure now he was trying to avoid another person ahead of me in the fast lane, but fuck him I'm not getting a 15 over ticket because he wants to faking race in the middle lane. So, after about 5 minutes of us riding, I'll let go of the gas and all the cars we pass, pass us again. This enrages the driver of the truck, who now is trying to drive as close as possible to my little car. I get over to the slow lane, he follows. Get over again, he follows, in chuff of my ass, after about 35 minutes of this, I'm almost home, and my heart is pounding. I have been in quite a few fights, but in my head I wondered if the guy was going to shoot me. I had taken my gun to Michigan, because I was moving there, and had left it with a friend. I felt helpless. So, I called one of my best friends whom I knew was off work by now, and this is how the convo went, note that we are the type to be like, hey faggot. When we call each other, me, shaken, eiii, what are you doing, friend, slightly taken back, umm, nothing, what's up, me, do you think you could meet me outside your place with your strap, and if this dude pulls on me, kill him. He is following me on the freeway and I think he means business friend. Brief silence, yeah. How far away are you? Brought me to almost tears instantly. And even typing it now makes me glad I know this cat. Cool faking guy. <coughs> Happened last year. A friend and I went trail running at Dixon Lake. Being my naturally competitive self, I took off running as fast as I can yelling. First one there gets a lap dance at the lake. It works well with guys not so much with girls lol, and what better motivation than that? So I'm running for what feels like forever, and happened to step in a small ditch on the way, and had to stop. Mind you I'm ahead of him by barely a mile, but still ahead nonetheless. At this point my ankle is kinda hurting, and I keep rolling it back and forth waiting for the pain to subside. Not a second, after I figured fuck it, I'm just going to run on my tarred ankle, he shoots, right past me, and yells fuckin are you nnn? Now, I had no idea what was going on, but didn't ask and took off running right behind him. As we're running I'm thinking whoa this is fun. Laughing while asking him dude wth is your deal? Only to notice that he has this terrified look on his face. I then luck back only to see, not one, but two coyotes running literally right behind us. One coyote trailing the other. As fast as I could yell oh my god what the fuck. I swear these two measly as coyotes were going to get to taste some Hawaiian for the first time in their lives ever. They run right past us and veer off to the right on a tinier trail. I almost double shat my running shorts. My running buddy and I stop and look at each other. Moment of silence and we bust out laughing. What the fuck really? We thought we were a gonna buy these two little coyotes, running like little beaches. Sigh. Good memories. <coughs> this actually happened to me on New Year's Eve this year I was visiting a friend in Edmonton this year for New Year's. For those of you who don't know, Edmonton is one of the larger northish cities in Canada and somewhat more redneck than other parts of Canada. The bars in this city have really good security, scan your ID, and take pictures of you as you enter, so they can prevent you from entering any bar in the city, if you get flagged. We were at a rather large bar having a good time. The booze was flowing freely, and good times being had by all. By the end of the evening I was quite drunk and my bladder was screaming to be emptied. I navigated through the flow of people trying to get to the bathroom and finally managed to get in line for the urinals. After what felt like an eternity I managed to get one and immediately unzipped to let her loose. At this point I'm swaying rather awkwardly having what could only be described as the longest piss of my life. I'm almost done when I feel a looming presence behind slash beside me. I turn to my left to discover a rather giant dude leering over my shoulder with a strange look on his face point I politely ask. Can I help you? I'm Canadian after all. His response? He hawks up a giant mouth full of lung butter and spits. On my still pissing dick point I blurt out what the fuck. He. Smart as replies yeah. That just happened in my drunken state I lost my sheet. Not even thinking I spun around. Dick flapping in the breeze. And punched the guy in the jaw. 
I'm not normally a fighter by any means, but the sight of this guy's disgusting logi dangling off my dick was too much. I hit him hard enough I felt his teeth smack together and his head tilt back. The guy hit the ground like a sack of hammers, so I found myself standing, dumbfounded at what had just happened, while a giant dude is twitching in a puddle of urine that he had collapsed in. My dick is still flapping in the breeze point I quickly ran to the sink, cleaned off my soiled member, and fled the scene. There were cops outside already as the bar was closing, and the last thing I needed was to get get arrested in an unfamiliar city. When I got outside my friends were gone, nowhere to be found point after a couple of minutes I received a text from my buddy, who had witnessed my speedy escape from the bar claiming I have never seen you run that fast, what's going on? I found their cab, and hopped in screaming go, go go, no time to explain point finally was able to get my story out on the drive back to the hotel. I'm still really confused as to how the whole thing happened. My roommate and I had been living together for about 10 months when she started to date this guy, Greg. Anytime Greg would come over he would bring his cousin with him. His cousin made it obvious he was interested in me, and I made it obvious I was not. He got pretty carried away with the infatuation. He would come into my room at all hours of the night, no locks on doors, lay in my bed, until I was so frustrated I would go sleep on the couch. I told my roommate and Greg not to bring him over anymore, but that only resulted in him not coming over as much point one night I had enough. I was in the living room at 3am watching a movie, my roommate sleeping on the couch. Her new boyfriend calls her up and wants to come over with his cousin because they had just left a party. I get up and go to bed, not wanting to deal with this guy. Sure enough, right when he gets there he comes in my room and won't leave, even though I'm yelling at him to- I knew he was drunk and shouldn't drive, so I tell him to sleep on the couch. He proceeds to curl up on the edge of my bed telling me he's going to sleep there like a dog. That's it. I picked him up, carry him outside of my room, and throw him with full force onto the floor. I go back in my room and sit in front of the door. For the next hour he keeps trying to get in, crying and telling me he's sorry, then calls his girlfriend to complain about it, and telling all he wants to do is cuddle with me. Seriously point an hour goes by, and he finally passes out. I get up, and rag my bed over to in front of the door to block in. Fast forward 4 hours later, 10am, and he's back at it juggling my door handle which wakes me up. I freak out. I go out of my door, and go off on him, he laughs. I do something worse than call the cops. I call my dad point my dad hears what happened and flips. He gets on the phone with my brother, what are you doing? You wanna take a drive? Angry voice, by the way, uh, I guess, but, I'm on my way, my. Dad gets there, and can hardly speak with rage, so my brother really doesn't know what's going on when he gets to my apartment, just that have to kick some guy out. My dad hardly gets in the door, when he's scaring the bejisu out of this guy. My dad is 6 feet 1, cousin is 5, 5, he was following him around my apt, while he got his things together, raging on him. Greg and his cousin promptly left, and my roommate started crying. Our parents are really good friends, so she was pretty, well, mortified. Did I mention she was naked under covers, when my dad barged in? She got over it pretty fast, when he went out to his truck, to grab his tray and roll us some joints to calm everybody down. TLDR. My dad called my brother to come over and kick out a guy who had been harassing me. Context. I had three roommates. One was Dan and one was Daniel. The other is unimportant to this story point me and my roommate Dan are sitting in our apartment watching some show on TV. Daniel had just left to do his laundry and would be back in a few minutes someone knocks on our screen door. I go over to see who it is, and it's three girls, that I've never seen before. I ask what I can do for them, and they say they are looking for Daniel. I assume they just mean Dan, since he was home, so I walk back into the apartment with a confused look and tell Dan, that three young girls, 16 to 19 years old, are asking for him. I have no idea why point he goes to the door, and comes back with a big grin and three girls behind him. They run into Daniel's room as Dan tells me that they are Daniel's friends from Dallas, we are in Austin, and want to surprise slash scare him. They hide in his room waiting for him to get back. 
he comes back into the apartment, but comes right to the living room without seeing the girls in his room. He starts joking about how few clothes he's wearing, inside joke for us roommates, and then starts stripping down trying to be funny. He drops his gym shorts, and is now in his usual outfit of just compression shorts. He jokes about how he's going to take those off, and we give him the stink eye, and tell him to shut up and stop. He's kinda confused, but responds by upping the ante even more, and starting to pull them down, while joking about doing some windmill action with his unit. My roommate then goes into boss mode and grunts, Daniel, shut up and put your shorts on, Daniel, complies, with a confused face, and walks over to his room. The girls proceed to silly string him point later that night he thanks us for keeping him from being butt naked walking in on a room of teenage girls tldr. Me and a roommate saved our third roommate from exposing himself to minors. And the associated shame slash embarrassment slash etc. Last year around middle of summer my dog Jack, who takes his role as neighborhood watchdog very seriously, wakes up at 2am and begins barking like crazy at the sliding glass door in my room. I sleepily walk over to the door in the living room, didn't have my keys in my room, to let him out, and watch as he runs to the chain link fence in back and proceeds to raise all sorts of hell, jumping, barking, and spinning around, all directed at the wash running through the alleyway. Squinting my eyes to see what Jack is upset about yields nothing, so I tell Jack to come back in. He happily comes back inside and goes straight back to the foot of my bed and lies down. Thinking it was nothing more one of his constant tormentors, neighborhood cats, I settle back down to sleep. Not more than two minutes after we lay down, Jack is up and barking at the door again. I'm a little upset at this time, I do have batting practice for my blind baseball team in the early morning. I storm over to the door again saying Jack there's nothing out there. Look. Back go the blinds and I see the brand new wooden fence that my neighbor across the alley had just put in early that week. Up in flames I run back to my room and grab my cell, my 9mm and my remains an 870. Pounding on my room at store I yell homie. Get up now. Let's go. He comes out of his room a moment later holding his running shoes thinking it was time for batting practice. I hand him the 870 and say again let's go. Dropping the shoes immediately, he grabs the shotgun and follows me outside, only pausing long enough to murmur oh sheet. When we get outside, whoever threw the Molotov cocktail must have taken off down the wash since Jack was no longer barking. We called 911 and the fire department came about 3 minutes later. Everything ended well point tldr dog knew there was an arsonist outside, owner didn't believe him. When owner realizes there was an arsonist outside, friend gets rudely awoken and handed a shotgun to go protect the neighborhood. Dog received much praise and tasty treats. A few years ago a few friends and I were in Switzerland near Lucerne on a road trip. For whatever reason they let college kids rent a car, I don't know. So we are driving through these towns in a valley, more or less lost, because none of us can speak any Swiss dialects, and we come across an American style diner with hamburgers and hash browns and the whole shabbing. We were excited of course, since none of us had enjoyed a solid diner type meal in several months, but as we drove the car into the lot we realized that there was a huge line of customers out the door. My buddy derp one was furious, he's from the south, and was sick of bratwurst and pastas and weird slavic foods. But we had other things to do, and a snowstorm was rolling in, so we all decided to drop it, and head out point we zigzagged around the town for a bit trying to get to the main road, but since we had failed to pick up the language in the past 30 minutes, we still had no idea where we were going. And then we came across a big open field, just as the slushy snow was starting to come down hard and the wind was picking up. Defeated, we pulled over near a little cabin slash kiosk thing on the side of the road to ask for directions. Derp one gets out of the car and walks towards the structure, cursing under his breath, because he now hates Switzerland. He's gone for a few minutes and we can only make out the shape of the hut at this point, so derp two and derp three, and I are just kicking the sheet in the car a bright violet light suddenly erupts somewhere in the field across the road from us the door of the hut swings open. We can see the silhouette of Derp 1 running towards us, and he sprints around the car to the passenger door, just as two Swiss assault helicopters buzz the road and make a hard turn right over the hut and turn on their spotlights. 
Derp one jumps in the car and starts yelling we gotta go, we gotta go. Two other cars coming the other direction slam on their brakes and zig across the road about 100 feet from us, and we are like dude, what the fuck is going on, no. Time no time just turn around and go. So derp two, driver, pulls one of those chase scene new turns, and guns it in the other direction back into the town as another helicopter flies overhead and the snow is getting blown everywhere, and two or three scene 2B military jeeps drive by, and we notice that there are actually a lot of cars driving the opposite direction. Back towards the field, but obviously there's no time to figure out why. So here are four Americans in a ghetto old rented Puget flying down these little roads as derp one is yelling left here. Right. Right again. No no, that road back there, and we have no idea what's going on, but we are all thinking Cloverfield or some weird Swiss gov conspiracy obviously. And then derp one yells okay, slow down here, right here. And we pull into a parking lot. And wouldn't you know, it's the parking lot for the American style diner. The lot is half empty, so we pull into a spot and stop, and up one opens the door, and gets out of the car, staring out across the town towards the sound of beating propellers for a moment, and leans back into the car, and asks anyone else want a grilled breakfast sandwich? I'm starving yes, we were all like, what the fuck? It turns out that the Swiss equivalent to our National Guard in that area, performs regular combat and emergency preparedness training scenarios and a lot of the locals go out and watch. As for Derp 1, the faker drove us back to the diner for lunch after a guy in the hut, turned out to be a sort of road stand market thing for travelers, gave him directions and a map, and told him about the exercise, since everyone else knew about it. Point true story. Point TLDR we thought we were gonna die at the hands of the Swiss, but my friend just drove us to a diner for lunch. Edit. The bright violet light was a flare FYI. I was building a computer for one of my old high school teachers. I was removing the back panel on the case, so I could insert the one that came with the motherboard. It was stuck to the case, so I'm wiggling it back and forth, back and forth, bending the metal so it'll break off. I start to pull down and it breaks away, sending my right index finger flying into the side of the case. I feel almost no resistance before I pull back. I look at my finger, and the tip is cut about halfway between the end and the last knuckle, almost to the bone, kind of just flopping around. I scream Sanuva Beach. I was 20 at the time, but in my parents' house visiting. Now, we normally keep swearing in our house to a minimum, unless it's used jokingly or for emphasis. Swearing in anger is highly frowned upon, so my dad yells back, what did you say, boy? My mom. However, recognized the anxiety in my voice and hollered, what's wrong? I run to the bathroom and grab a rag to hold my finger together and yell, I said, we need to go to the emergency room. Now. My dad, having recognized that I was in trouble, asked what was wrong. I said, uh, now, I'll explain on the way, so. We packed into the truck and start the drive while I explained what happened. Ended up with stitches that looked like this. Funny thing was that I was supposed to play guitar in a show at the local dance hall two weeks later. Did it with the stitches and a band-aid. I'd just moved to New Orleans to finish my degrees. At the time I was dating this guy from New Zealand who was working in DC. He flew down on Friday to spend the weekend with me just before school started to go to all the new school year parties, etc. Point Saturday morning we are still lounging in bed, but I finally get up to make pancakes. My phone rings. I barely say, hello. Before my girlfriend screeches, the hurricane moved in the middle of the night. Are you packing? Honestly, I didn't even know there was a hurricane at all. Dude, I'm from Los Angeles. I plan for unexpected decimation, not the kind you're notified of point I calmly replied, yes and hung up the phone. Then I threw my guy his clothes and told him to call the airline that he was getting on a flight back to DC. I started packing his things, focused on getting out of there rather than continuing to talk. I remember telling him, don't ask questions, just do it. At some point I said the word hurricane point of course the city was in chaos, he couldn't get a flight out. We ended up throwing everything into my car, picking up a couple of freshmen who didn't have a way out of the city, and driving to Houston. The senator my boyfriend was working for was more than happy to give him the extra couple days off, 
to escape from a hurricane. So who says politicians don't have a heart? I was stuck at the end of the orange line in Maryland and had to get back to Virginia. No cell phone, no money in my bank account or in cash. I had spent the last it, stupidly, and my friend who had dropped me off at the station was long gone. I was 16 and from a rural New Jersey town and definitely not used to public transit slash what to do in that situation point I followed what looked like a class of students through the turnstile, just sticking close enough behind one that I slipped through. I thought I was golden until I got to Dan Loring. When you exit the metro, you have to swipe your card to charge the amount for the ride. I didn't have a card and tried to jump the gate. Unfortunately for me, there was a security guard I didn't see who nabbed me and started questioning me point I was sweating because I'd barely been in trouble with anything less than a mall cop up until that point. Luckily, sometime more important caught his attention at the other end of the platform. He told me wait here and walked away for a second. I knew that my boyfriend was supposed to be coming soon to pick me up from the station, so I just turned and ran out, hoping he was in the parking lot point he was, thank god. And I jumped in his mother's car as I see the security guard walking back and looking for me. I told him, just drive. He had noticed my mild panic and took off, getting out of the parking lot and through the gate as soon as he could. This thread is old and this comment will probably never be seen, but whatevs when I was like 8, my brother and I were playing outside, and we had this pop-up camper that I was using as like a little clubhouse. He was outside, I was reading inside the camper there was this crazy beach who had psycho dogs that she let run around outside, and since we live on a farm, you can kinda guess where they ended up. These things were attacking animals all over the place, we had like dead raccoons possums, the neighbor's cat, they would just attack anything. Well, these were guard dogs for some important person or something that had been rejected for being too vicious and she took them so they wouldn't be put down. Same person? Right, in a hoe, I get out of the camper to go to the bathroom and I see all three of these things running towards my little bro, who is for at this point, from across the field. He didn't see them coming and freaked out when I grabbed him and dragged him inside the camper saying, stop fighting me, I'm trying to help. I lock the door and he's crying saying I'm hurting him then boom. The dogs are barking and throwing themselves on the door, trying to get in. Well, he's panicking and I'm just waiting for someone to hear the dogs barking so they can come get us out of nowhere I hear, faking dogs, and my dad is firing his shotgun at the ground trying to scare them away. They go running, and he nearly sprints, which is difficult, since he's got nerve damage in his one leg, over to us. My dad's face, when he saw that we were okay, was one of the most happy things I can think of. He pulled me aside when everything settled down, and told me how proud he was of me, gave me a huge hug, and just rocked me for a moment. I was so confused, I thought that was what you were supposed to do in the situation, but he probably thought an 8 year old would just freak out and get hurt. Point TLDR, crazy ladies vicious dogs were coming for my brother, I dragged him in the camper, saved him from being mauled. So I'm 18 years old with my good buddy in Mexico City we are on the second to last night of what has so far been a hellish trip. The previous three weeks had entailed getting run in with tranny strippers, losing all my credit cards, beer, and shoes to Mexican bandits. We go out one last night in hopes of having a quiet night and a few drinks. That goes to sheet when we meet up with a pack of wild Irish slash Aussie dudes who love to get faked up and meet strange women. Smartly I decline to go to the strip club with them when we leave the bar and I go back to the youth hostel around midnight. I hear the guys coming in at 6 and blind as faking drunk. The Aussie is yelling at a fat chick who stole his bunk and the Irish dudes are making a fat ton of noise waking me up, telling me how they got ripped off by a hoe who didn't carry condoms on her. So I go outside to subdue the situation. Bad move. But they just get more loud and obnoxious, and I end up getting lumped in with this crew. Fast forward 2-2-3 two, two, minutes and I'm outside my door getting yelled at by a crazy Mexican woman yeah an animal, yeah a faking animal I can't explain sheet, so the manager comes up and says we have 5 minutes to pack our sheet and leave because the police have already been called. I run into my friend's bunk, 
shake him to wake him up and basically said no time to explain pack your sheet. We gotta go. We made it out. When I was around 17 or so, a good looking lady friend picked me up and drove to a local bar. We weren't asked for ID and proceeded to drink the night away. The bar closes and she had parked behind the bar. Instead of going in the front seat, she got in the back and told me to hop in. Without hesitation I hope and get into it. Round 1 finishes and we go to leave, but the car won't start. We call a cab and I explain I'll be back momentarily as I have to pee. I leave the car without my jacket, it's winter, and proceed to piss in the alley near the bar dick out mid piss a cop car slow rolls right in front of me and flicks on the cherries. I tuck in midstream and bolt in front of the car down a stairway to a large parking lot. I loose a shoe and continue running with officers on my tail. Thankfully there was enough distance between me and the police officer that I was able to duck under a building. The building was built over a medium sized stream so there is an area underneath where you can walk around, standing, and call my mother to pick me up, 2am. This building is only about 500 meters away from the police station so as I'm sitting there waiting, I can see two other squad cars pulling into the lots searching for me with their spotlights. Mom pull ups, I'm sweaty, missing a shoe, covered in my own piss, the stink of booze on my underage breath, and wheeze out instructions, to drive to the bar, she begins to ask why no time just geo, pull up to the bar laddie friend is super pissed, and asks where I had been no time get in the car drive home was silent, mother commented on the amount of police in the area, and joked that they were probably looking for me, had been. Arrested that summer, out of harm's way I finally explained to everyone what had happened. Mother super unhappy, lady friend invited me in for more. Pounding on hotel door at 4am in Acapulco, Mexico. Answer it and it is my buddy and he just says I need 3000 pesos right now. With a look of fear in his eyes I didn't have any pesos left because we were leaving in about 6 hours. To go back home point he said he couldn't explain why. We went across the street to an ATM, and it was broken. Luckily we found another one down the street after a little searching point I gave him the money and he disappeared. About an hour later he shows back up at the room point apparently the cops had grabbed him for being on the beach after hours. They wanted him to give them money or they would put him in jail. He told them he didn't have any money, true, he was broke. They drove him all over town from ATM to ATM, and he kept showing them his bank account was empty. Eventually they took him out into the middle of nowhere, and some captain looking guy with a machine gun was screaming at him, and telling him he had to go back to the hotel, and get the money from us, or he would go to jail, and miss his flight. He also told him not to say, why he needed it, or tell anybody point he gave them the cash, that gave him back all his stuff and let him go point he will not go to Acapulco again. Has happened quite a few times often it's just a friend that needs a wingman help escaping the day after one night stands or that they started some serious trouble in the bar you're at point a good one was when I had a terrible evening with my current fac buddy from out of town we were at this fancy cocktail bar with some of my more distinguished friends this was the night I realized my fac buddy hated my guts and was secretly in love with my friend. Sitting right across from me. The most unpleasant guy in the world calls me, my better friend and the only guy that has the same logic way of reasoning as I. Dude shut the fuck up stop, being an ibga get to cabs put yourself and whoever else fits in them and haul us to this address what? I said stop, being an ibga now hurry point I did all my friends and fact buddy got sort of startled, but sort of agreed when I threatened them with a broken champagne bottle, it was just one of those nights. The cabs was expensive as fact point turned out this was the greatest most debauched party of the century basically just loads of people running around in bikinis, drinking rum like no tomorrow, skinny dipping in jacuzzis, and getting their freak on pretty much everywhere the first night I couldn't really handle that big amount of awesome, and neither did my friends one forgot he was naked except sombrero, and started hitting on chicks in the kitchen. I puked up pickled herring with tomato sauce on my fac buddies nether regions, while trying to get my freak on one friend got obsessed and started stealing every goddamn shoe in the place, to prevent anyone from leaving, since this was too great to ever end etc point etc point etc fortunately the parents of the girl who lived in the mansion was gone for two more weeks, 
So we all pitched in and just continued for another week it was the best summer of my life. When I was about 14, a group of 5 of us were hanging out when we ran out of soda. We sent my friend and my cousin to a gas station about a mile away while the rest of us hung out on the corner and waited for them. A few minutes later they came running back, full sprint. The city we lived in was kind of rough, so without explanation we started running until we reached my house, jumped the gate into my yard, and caught our breath. They then explained that on their way to the store they saw a car break down while going uphill. The car then started rolling backwards. My friend and cousin were kind of jerks, so they pointed and laughed hysterically. The car was full of gang members, and one of them was particularly mad. He got out of the car, and my friend and cousin weren't scared, until he reached, like he had a gun, and they bolted point. When they told us the story, we said well that's all fine and well, but we still, don't have any soda. So they went back, and this time I went with them. We got to the gas station, the angry gang member was there waiting for us. The area next to the gas station had some houses built about a story higher up, and he hid up there waiting for us. He pulled his gun out and started cursing us out and telling us that he'd hurt people for less while we tried in vain to convince him he had the wrong people. When he decided he'd made us poop our pants long enough, he let us go. The oddest thing to me was when he let us go, he said a phrase in Spanish that roughly translates to don't let this get you down or have a good day anyway. TLDR my friends laughed at gang members and almost got us shot. I grew up with a crazy mother, she has borderline PD. Around the age of 16 she had started dating some weird army dude and had him move into the house after their third date or something. Shortly thereafter she was threatening to throw me out of the house. I wasn't a bad kid, no drugs or violence or anything, but I got mistreated a lot. Over the course of some months life started getting really really bad. She took my keys, my phone, took all the phones out of the house, changed the alarm code so I could never leave the house, took the computer into another room that was padlocked, and stopped buying food. So I was basically trapped in the house with nothing to eat, by someone who would verbally and physically abuse me constantly, and no way to contact anybody point I packed a bag, real secret like, and when she wasn't looking I pried open the reserve battery box for the alarm system and disconnected it. That way, by unplugging the alarm, it would just shut off and not keep ringing if it ever went off. One day, sheet went down. I didn't know if she'd beat me again or what, so I went downstairs, grabbed my bag and my guitar, unplugged the alarm and slipped out. As soon as I got out the door I bolted. As I was running I heard her run out and start the car. I ran fast as I could and slipped behind the back fence of a house nearby and heard her zip by right after. I ended up walking to a friend's place and it's all history from there. After, during, a night of excessive drinking, the drunk wife of a friend, after starting an argument with said friend, decides to ignore the DD, take the keys and drive us all home. Because she was driving like a drunk angry person, my stomach decided it was time to puke all over their brand new car, including the driver. Sitting in the back seat and puked over the shoulder of the driver, it was nazi, so she pulls over, everybody gets out of the car, and the supposed DD says strip. She was very attractive, and I was hammered, so I was down to my underwear in 5 seconds flat. While I was standing on the side of the road in my underwear covered in vomit, a single vehicle driving way too fast decides to swerve right in front of us, tried to correct, and ends up rolling about 4 or 5 times. It was a Jeep Grand Cherokee, both people in the car were bleeding, but otherwise seemed okay. Another car came by and offered to take the two bleeding girls to the hospital. At first the two girls didn't want to go, but the driver was an off-duty EMT and forceful, saying there could be brain injury due to bleeding from the nose, so he finally just yelled, get in the faking car now so I did. About a half hour later I sober up slightly, while getting dropped off at the hospital er in my underwear with two girls covered in blood. I have no wallet, cell phone, clothes etc, and I was under 21. Had to call my mom to come pick me up. She thought it was hilarious, so the next day my friend says what the fuck happened to you last night. Nobody had seen me get into the car, and they were left standing there with my clothes, and no idea where I was. 
this isn't quite a no time to explain story, but it's pretty close and completely awesome point my roommate's girlfriend planned a day at Wrigley Field for his birthday. It consisted of rounds of batting practice, grounders, and fly balls on the field, facilitated by the coaches, followed by a free meal in the Ivy Club, and tickets to the Cubs Sox game that day, first game of the new Crosstown Cup. This was also the day of the Black Hawks parade, so it was an awesome day to go to Chicago in general. The catch was you needed to be at Wrigley before 8am, which from our town would have meant leaving by around 5.30, since the only good way to get there is by train point anyway. I was hanging out with her and a few others the night before this big day, and she mentions in passing that my lazy roommate opted out of batting practice so he could sleep in. After I comment on what a dumbass he is, she mentions that I could have the passes and bring a friend. My jaw drops. I'm a gigantic Cubs fan, so hearing this immediately makes me question whether or not I'm dreaming point. After I finally accept that this is really happening, I realize the reality of the situation. It's 11pm and I have less than 9 hours to find a friend and get to Wrigley Field. I have a really close buddy who was the obvious choice. So I immediately gave him a ring and caught him just as he was about to go to bed. After I explain the situation and he clears his schedule, it's decided. We are going to Wrigley Point. It's important to keep in mind that we are planning a trip from the suburbs to Chicago on the day of the Black Hawks parade and the opening came of the Crosstown Cup. Not something easily done in 6 hours. Fortunately, everything worked out flawlessly, and we made it there with only one hiccup in which we missed a stop taking the L from Ojal V to Edison. This ended up being one of the most memorable days of my life, and it's all thanks to my roommate's lazy as it was Lester Strode tossing BP, Alan Trammell hitting grounders, and Larry Rothschild hitting pop flies TLDR received two passes to take batting, practice on Wrigley Field 9 hours, before I had to get there. About 3 months ago I was in a Ukrainian restaurant with my family. It was a paper plates type of place with excellent peroges, borscht, etc. We were finishing up our meal when an older man walked in and asked the woman proprietress whether her husband was in. She went out back to get him and when he came back up front his only question was you for by. To the older man. We thought this was odd but shrugged it off as bad English, paid our bill and went. We were nearly home when my sister realized she forgot her jacket at the restaurant. Back we went. I was voted the unlucky one to grab the jacket from the restaurant and though it was now closed, the door was open point I looked up from walking in the door to see 10 to 12 older Canadian, Chinese and Ukrainian men all sat at a table with beers and little tin foil packages the size of sausages. I froze uncomfortably and said hi guys. My sister lost her jacket, and it would be so cool of you if you could hand it to me. The proprietress's husband just gave me a stern look before telling me there is no jacket for you here. Girl point I ran out of the restaurant, jumped back into the car, and started yelling for my mother-in-law to drive. What's wrong? What's wrong? She kept asking. No time to explain. Drive. Point Anne. So that's why we avoid Red Mobster. I was playing in my adult league's championship game and my wife was two weeks from her due date. I set my cell phone on high and vibrate and put it in a fanny pack that I wore above my pants at the second intermission I went to the bench and checked my phone and what the fuck I missed her call saw she texted, are you almost done, I think it's time, 15 minutes prior. I jumped onto the ice and while skating to the gate I screamed to my coach in my wildest eyed highest pitch voice, I can't be here, I got a geo, no more. I clomped into the locker room, fell down over the bench, grabbed my shoes, then spent what felt like 30 minutes trying to get my damn laces open, never using waxed laces again. Oh, and when you're in a hurry and trying to get skates off you act like a goddamn monkey, loosen a few, yank yank yank. Stuck, loosen a bit more, yank yank yank, no dice, loosen all the way, plop goes the skate, then repeat for the other boot. Anyway, I get my shoes on, leave my skates on the floor, forget my bag, run to the car in full gear, and realize I forgot my keys, run back, grab my keys, run back to the car and hop in, still wearing full pads. The drive is only 5 minutes, 30 in pregnant wife in labor time though. 
I was too frantic to call, so I just drove point I get home expecting to see her standing there with bag in hand, but instead she's sitting at the table staring at me, like I sprouted a second head. Apparently, she felt cum contractions, but she was pretty sure it was just cramping. It was in fact just cramping point my team lost, 7 to 8, in art, and I was their leading scorer, more than 30% of their goals that year. I was too embarrassed to tell them the truth, so I called my coach and told him I had food poisoning and asked that he collect my stuff and I'd pick it up later. Two weeks later was our award ceremony, and when I walk in all the guys are standing there smiling and yell at me, well, was it a boy or a girl? They knew point oh, and my firstborn was a boy, induced into labor two weeks after the ceremony. I'll be buried, but it's a pretty good story point I was tubing on the Guadalupe River with my friends, floating in a tire in a tube down a river, and I knew that one of them that lived in the city was deathly afraid of snakes. I've lived by the river my whole life and only ever saw a few snakes anyways. We were drinking a bit and laughing and I noticed something moving behind her. It was a 3 foot water moccasin and I guess it was curious because it was heading straight for her and only had a couple of more feet to go. All of our tubes are tied together and I'm on one end, you know, as the guide. I immediately smack my hands on the water to scare it off. No one else has noticed it but me. It didn't stop point I knew, if I said something, she would absolutely freak, try to get out, flip out, attempt to hit it or something. So with only seconds I begin Olympic style backstrokes. It was the hardest and fastest I had ever paddled, I had to drag 4 people. Everyone looked at me, like I was insane, smacking the water and suddenly paddling with all my might, no facts given, that I was splashing the sheet out of everyone, drinks spilt, sunglasses lost forever. I yell paddle, now, and everyone follows suit somewhat bewildered point I saw it take off a priver. I guess the giant, 4 tube, splashing monster finally scared it. We stopped and I explained what happened, pointing out the slithering ripples of the snake about 30 feet a priver. My friend on the end immediately began frantically searching around her for another and promptly fell out. She panicked, gulped water, and we all had to help to drag her back into the tube and get her calm point I guess I made the right decision point tldr, tubing on the river with a friend afraid of snakes. See a snake. Paddle for dear life. I was a senior in high school when this happened. One sun set me and my friends were in my truck at the top of this big hill where most of the rich people of the neighborhood lived. Big houses, getting sold and moved into constantly. There is a water tower at the top of the hill, behind one of the newer bigger houses, and it was a common smoke place slash sunset view for me and my mates. So we are halfway through a blunt, parked overlooking the town and all the big houses enjoying the seclusion and high times. The guy next to me gets out of the car to take a piss, while he is outside the car we see a light flashing from down the hill, everyone else was like what the fuck, but the guy pissing couldn't see it. I turn down the music, lean my head out the window, and yell finish up, and get in the car why? Just then I see the source of the light. A man who had just bought the house beneath the water tower was climbing the side of the hill with a giant flashlight and an even bigger axe in hand. Stoned point as point fact no one reacts. To lasered to even comprehend. Get in the faking car now. Someone came to their senses and yells to the guy pissing the man who bought the house starts screaming that we are peeping toms, looking into his wife's bathroom window, says he already called the police and we are trespassing sheep man we only wanted to get stoned, not killed, so the guy pissing hops in the truck bed and we bolt, screaming like little girls the entire way home point tldr, smoking at awesome sunset spot when crazed axeman accusing us of being peeping toms chases us off his property. Holy shit, I've been waiting for this thread for 2 years, so I was on a date with a girl in Toronto, and it's maybe 10pm on a Saturday. We've just arrived at a busy intersection, and are waiting for the little white man to say walk. Just as the crosswalk is about to change, a cab slides through the yellow and veers across the crosswalk, parking on the other side of the road. Someone my date knows jumps out, and runs across the street. Hey, oh man, what are you up to? A short bubbly blonde friend of my date engages us in the middle of the crosswalk, 
talking animatedly and telling us that something fun is happening at her place and we should just jump in the cab that's right behind her on the other side of the street, but we are late, so rush 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 and all that. My date and I have one of those quick non-verbal conversations in order to okay it with one another and decide to join in. So as this bubbly friend is getting into the front seat and speaking with the cabbie, my date asks so how do you know this girl? But at this point, we are already getting into the back point so once in the cab, the girl's still talking unimitedly to the driver and erecting him to her place, so I have time to whisper things out with my date. I say that I have no bloody clue who this is, and that it might be fun to see where things go, and that how the hell do we broach this topic with the crazy stranger who we are starting to believe is coked up out of her skull, the topic being we've just realized we don't know you, and who are you, and where are we going? But we didn't need to figure much out, because the girl leans back, just as we were whispering about what to do next. Apparently she has a crush on a female DJ at a bar, and has convinced her to drop into her house soon, under the impression that there is a party going on. Some of her friends are already waiting at her place, but she just needed a few more people. She wants us to play along, and pretend that we actually know her, because otherwise, ick now, her friends might find it a little weird. And if it's weird and not fun, then she might not get laid. Or something like that. Okay, that sounds almost coked up reasonable. I thought to myself as I put away my vague concerns of Axe Murdery Point. So we arrive at her place, and there are two people waiting outside. We step out of the cab, and there are quick, awkward introductions before we are whisked into her apartment. This girl is talking a mile a minute and consuming all the oxygen in the stairwell with a constant stream of mostly unilateral conversation, apparently trying to smooth out the fact that we don't know anything about her, so we get up to the apartment. Two more people there. And so began the most awkward 30 minutes of my social life. The hostess, as I'll call her, almost didn't stop to take a breath throughout the whole time, so vigorous was she trying to fuel conversations and keep us from looking foolish in our unfamiliarity with the social circle. All seven of us kinda hung out and engaged in high level conversations about nothing in particular. At one point, the hostess took out a photo album and we idly looked through. I asked a question about a photo that was maybe a little too indicative of our ploy, and in front of everyone, she kinda hissed at me and gave me an angry look before focusing attention back on her photo narrations. And every once in a while, usually when the conversation started to go in too personal a direction, the hostess would jump in and hijack the conversation onto another topic point here's the TLDR slash denouement. Maybe you've guessed where this is going. I was mostly preoccupied with playing my own part and feigning a relationship with the hostess, so that's my only excuse for not seeing it sooner. But anyhow, it slowly dawned on me that no one at this party knew one another. This crazy coked up fack had gone out with a cab into the Toronto night, collecting pairs of people and telling each that she was meeting friends for a party, but sssshhh they think we all know one another, so don't ruin the surprise. She had kept us separate until the party started, and then tried to corral us all into a real elaborate charade, so that she could maybe sleep with a DJ later so, while our hostess was quickly calling her DJ crush to get an eater, I conferred with my date in a corner, and we decided we should best get going. At the time, we didn't understand totally what was going on, but we had figured it out enough that the sheer sense of mystery wasn't keeping us around any longer the cute girl may have been bad sheet crazy, but I still applaud her for the enormity of the hoax she tried to pull off. Bravo, you crazy coked up hustler, bravo. I was studying in France during the summer, I'm from the US, and one day my friends didn't show up for class. Midway through class my phone started ringing repeatedly, so I left to check the message. It said, Sklee, we booked you a ticket to Rome. Come to the train station immediately, so. I took the bus back to the apartment where I was staying and left a note for the lady who was hosting me saying I'd be gone for a while and wasn't sure when I'd be coming back. Got down to the train station and called my mom in the states. I was in high school at the time. Me, how do you feel about me taking a trip to Rome? Mom, I'm okay with it. When? Me, but I'm on the train right now. Point our train was delayed, so we missed the connection. There were no more trains going to Italy that night, so we had to figure out what to do. 
I was talking to the agent and saw there was a train going to Marseille's in 5 minutes. I exchanged our tickets and ran to my friend saying, we are going to Marseille's, no time to explain, run, belly, made the train and got into Marseille's at 2am. We got off the train and apparently the station is in the ghetto, as it was not looking like we made a good decision. As we got closer to the water though it was better, so we got a hostel and had an awesome next day wandering around Marseille's. I have two from when I was working at a summer camp point I was working at a summer camp for the second year in a row. We have a week before the kids get there to train and learn our jobs for the summer as well as dances and skits. During training there is always a burn camp that uses a very small portion of the facilities. My coworker and I were outside setting up for our class, which was on the outer edge of camp, when one of the head counselors pulls up in their car and says get in now. Having worked there previously I knew this was highly unusual as we weren't allowed to drive in the camp, except during the weekends even during training week. We piled into the car and got taken to the theater and told to go inside. In there we see all our fellow counselors and the burn kids camp. We sit down waiting to find out what was going on. We see all the burn camp kids and their counselors file out orderly and leave. Then our camp manager gets on stage and lets us know that there was a chemical factory that produces chlorine nearby that blew up and a chlorine gas cloud was heading our way. The burn kids didn't know about it, but due to their conditions they needed to get out first. We were to leave once they had left. As we walked to the buses, to evacuate us the gas cloud had just started to reach the camp. If you have ever gone to an indoor pool and you know the smell and slight eye burning sensation when you first walk in, image that times 100. Needless to say we quickly got on the bus and got the heck out of there until the cloud passed TLDR. Head camp counselor said get in car, we didn't question it ended up being evacuated because of deadly chlorine gas cloud from nearby exploding chemical factory point I was asked to fill in for a sick counselor on the night hike to do s'mores and stories. I normally work the pool during this time and had so for both years, this took place the same year as previous incident. I'd be there as half camp went to the pool and half went for s'mores and stories at small offside campsite. I knew the trail and knew the way to get there relatively well. I'm in the middle of the group though as I don't know it well enough at night. Right as we get to a fork in the in the trail one of the head counselor runs down to me and tells me to get the kids running faster and I'm to relieve a colleague at the fork and make sure every kid runs and doesn't go the way we normally do. Then he runs toward the end of the line. So I do that, and once the last kid passes me, I start running with the last two counselors who are bringing up the end of the line. As we get to our destination which had the buses already there, to take us back to camp. I ask them why, ah we did not go the other way and they explain to me a code black had happened. I having never done the hiking trail with campers, had no clue what that meant. Now I have to explain that there is a local violent cult that likes to worship an Indian burial ground near camp and oftentimes they brought guns to keep from getting arrested and turns out the head camp counselor at the front of the line had seen several local cult man with the guns on our usual path. Luckily they hadn't seen the kids or any of the counselors and the path I was blocking ended up being the path they had been on. Needless to say I was glad we booked it out of there, then realized I'd been the sacrificial counselor if the guys had decided to come down the trail point TLDR, doing night hike for the first time ever asked to get kids to run and block off a normal trail we take and then to book it once the last kid is passed. Turns out I blocked a path to crazy violent cult guys with guns. A girl I know was visiting her recently retired parents here in central Texas for the first time since they'd retired and she wanted to do something local and distinctly non-California. That weekend was the Stonewall Peach Festival Jubilee Rodeo. This was what she chose to do. So I packed up and headed out to BFE so we could go to the rodeo. We stood out, lung her from Austin and hot girl from Sokol. But hey, we were just there to watch. First there was a prayer, then they played the national anthem, then they brought out the flags with a color guard, then they played the national anthem again, then there was another prayer, then they had the queen of the peach festival drive through in a giant white Cadillac convertible waving. For each of these events she was making fairly quiet rolling commentary, but there was a very large denim clad gentleman sitting in front of us who obviously could hear her and did not like her attitude. 
so after 10 minutes of kids chasing goats and 20 minutes of kids riding around barrels, we got to the main event, and another prayer. This is it, this is why we are here. Some real Texas rodeo action and the crowd is really cheering and stomping. First bull rider out of the chute, goes flying and gets stomped. The crowd suddenly gets very quiet, and you could hear her say they should have prayed harder. I saw the guy and then I'm tense up apostrophe okay, enough rodeo, time to go. I grabbed her hand, and dragged her out of the stands, with pretty much everyone in earshot staring daggers at us. One day when I was younger, my sister and I were home alone on a weekend. We were watching movies and thought the only logical thing to do was make some popcorn to snack on. We were all out of the microwavable stuff, so my sister insisted she knew how to make stove top. She had made it many times before, so I didn't think much of it. She starts to heat up the oil and comes back into the living room and shuts the glass pane door behind her. We keep watching our movie and she eventually leaves to go check on the oil. She then walks up to the glass door leading into the living room, waving her hands and yelling my name, and then books it. I was pretty confused at this point, so I walk up to the door, only to notice tons of smoke pouring into view. I quickly run into the kitchen to try to extinguish it. Being young and not knowing much about fire, I grab a cup of orange Kool-Aid and open the fridge door, to use as a shield, to get close to the burning pot. I then throw the cup of Kool-Aid on the grease fire that is happening on our electric stove. Flames shot across the kitchen. Lucky the fridge door saved me from the fireball. I called it quits and ran out of the house. We went to our neighbors who then went to see what happened. The fire was out and everything had minimal damage, except the pot. Needless to say, our parents gave us a talking to about how to properly deal with a situation like that. My sister also got a talking to for leaving her younger brother in the house with a fire. I like to think I extinguished that fire with my little cup of Kool-Aid, though point TLDR sister set our stove on fire while making popcorn, and basically left me to burn, not really. I tried to extinguish it with Kool-Aid. Minimal damage but great memory. My husband calls me at work, and says come pick me up, no time to explain. When I get him from his work, he tells me to drive home fast. Our kitty cam camera had been set to take a snapshot, if it detects motion, and send the picture to his email. He had set it like this two weeks prior to this day, after we had our house broken into point he was sitting at his desk at work and ding, new email, there's a guy in our dining room. My husband, we will call him Keith, called the police, and was on the phone with them trying to explain about a guy in our house who is now being watched with live streaming video by Keith Point the police were surprised and excited to have so much info about what was going on, they kept Keith on the phone as they are driving to our house. All the while Keith is watching this guy go through our house gathering things to take. Two weeks to the day prior to this someone has broken in and taken computers, and a few other things, and now he was back to get the rest, the police say we have the house surrounded, and Keith sees the guy recognizing he is trapped in the house. The guys puts the stuff down and casually tries to walk out of the house like he lives there. The cops take him down point we pull up to the house and the guy was already taken away, but we all stand around the dining room all giddy with excitement laughing. Best part is all the still photos of the entire event were emailed to Keith, including the canine dog and cops coming through the house and us all standing there celebrating. Turns out it was a punk kid that lives down the street. He smashed our back window with a rock. We fixed it, then he smashed a different one the second time point we have an alarm system now, and kitty cam on full alert. This is sort of a no time to explain story. Me and three buddies all about 17 to 18 headed down to the city, Baltimore, the day before graduation. We we, rent city guys, and were still pretty young and stupid. We had this fella stop us who wasn't dressed entirely bad, and ask us for money and our first misstate was giving him 5 bucks. This guy attached to us, and at some point, mentioned he had some females and jet in our dick suit which one of my friends for whatever reason was like okay where? So this guy starts leading us down the street sort of near a rally, and is walking next to one of my friends who said okay, and the other three of us are like what the fuck is going on? 
Just then we notice him switch a revolver from his waist into his pocket. Not sure what to say, because my friend next to him did not see it I turn around, and my other two buddies had stopped, and were about 100 feet away looking around a corner, so I'm like Patrick, my friend who was next to him. We have to go now, and he's like what? I'm like I got to get home now. I know if I give off any signs, or say anything we could be robbed or worse. So the guy, who calls himself Tony, says okay you guys, can go just give me $3 for a pizza man which I did, and we were off we still talk about how stupid that was I could see it now 4 kids shot the day before graduation point buddy tries to get his friend's dick sukajits shot. It was my wedding night, and we rented out a couple of cottages at the beach, we thought we had the wedding at. At the main house we had an after party that all my friends were at. Two friends were missing and it upset me a little, so I called one. He said he was at the bar and that made me even more angry. He was kind of panicked though I couldn't understand him too much, but I picked up something about my other friend stuck in the bathroom. I went to the bar, that was I the main part of the resort, and found my friend in the bathroom with the girlfriend of the stuck friend. The bathroom was flooded. I asked where the other friend was, and he pointed to the stall. I looked in the stall and there he is, naked on the toilet with his clothes in a puddle on the floor. The toilet is clogged with sheet and vomit and paper towels. He had vomit all over himself. I run out of the bathroom to a different cottage where two friends were laying down to get ready for the after party, which was weed enough, and I say let's go. They are confused because I'm sweating and out of breath from running. I say grab some trash bags and let's go. No time to explain. To wrap it up we got him cleaned up, and in bed after a couple of us vomited as well, but I can only imagine what they thought I needed running in like that. Glad to know I got friends that could possibly help me hide a body no questions asked, although it was my wedding night point TLDR on your wedding night people will do almost anything for you. In our college dorm, we often ran scams on dominoes at the time, they had those dominators, where was a giant rectangle of pizza point the scam was to go to the public payphone of the dorm next door, which was within perfect viewing distance, and order like two or three dominators. Then, we would have somebody use their phone number to order some basic pizza at our dorm point so, what would happen was, the driver would show up at the other dorm first, and give up after a few minutes. Some smart cigarette smoker realized that he kept all the pizzas in the back of his pickup point. When he gets to our dorm, he parks, but it's a bit of a trek to the front lobby to use to the phone to call the phone number. I guess this scam wouldn't have worked with cell phones. Anyway, at the point where he leaves his car, we swarm his vehicle for those other pizzas, then run back into the dorm, closing the locked doors behind us, then hiding out in a dorm room with the lights off. As we ate the pizza point sometimes, the poor driver would get inside the building or get the CSOs involved, but even if they knocked and knocked on the door, they eventually would just give up. No probable cause. And they would sometimes call the phone number and leave a message that the number was blacklisted point it didn't matter much because by the end of the year, the entire dorm had gotten blacklisted point for the no time to explain, let's go part. Sometimes you would be having a cigarette outside with the door propped open and totally unaware of a pizza scam going on, so you sometimes had to abandon the cigarette and run inside or hold open the door for the pizza thieves but close it for the pizza delivery guy and then pretend to be totally oblivious 